Preface of Bilihilt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bilihilt, A Tale of the Irish Missionaries in Germany, A.D. 703. Given in English by Julie Sutter. Preface. This little tale, retold rather than translated, is taken from the German of Professor Ebrard of Erlangen, to whom we are indebted for much information concerning the early church of Ireland and Scotland, known in ecclesiastical history as the Chaldean Church. The story of Bilihilt carries us back more than a thousand years to the first growth of Christianity, which now spreads as a mighty tree. In that time the Church of Ireland shone as a very star in the West. Her learned men were the pride of courts, and her missionaries carried the pure gospel far and wide. Germany and Switzerland to a great extent were Christianized from Ireland. The early Church of Ireland was eminently a mission church, and the manner in which she set to work was not without a tinge of colonization. Her messengers went forth by bands of twelves, twelve brethren under an abbot, with their wives and families, forming the nucleus, as it were, of a community, would found their cenobie in the wilds of some heathen land, bring their influence to bear upon the people round about them, their charity, that is, winning them to the Lord, the cenobie growing and sending forth new bands of workers to found new settlements elsewhere. It was the Chaldean Church, and not Rome, which in this manner was chiefly instrumental in Christianizing the heart of Western Europe. For derivation of the word Chaldee, setting aside others, we give Professor Ebrart, from the Gaelic, Kela, fellow or man, and De, God. At any rate, men of God, the Irish missionaries were called by the heathen wherever they went. Bilihild and Hayden are no fiction. The men of God occurring in these pages, one and all, are historic, and the little story, in the best and deepest sense, is true. J.S. End of Preface Chapter 1 of Bilihild by Julie Sutter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. A Dying Mother I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. Psalm 39, 12 In a small, low-thatched cabin, roughly built of wood, lay a woman past middle life with sunken eyes and the flush of fever on her cheeks. Her couch was a broad wooden bench, her covering a couple of bearskins. Her clothing consisted of an ample garment of undyed sheep's wool. Beside the bed, if such it could be called, an earthenware jug, filled with spring water, was placed on a log within the reach of her feeble hands. A younger woman, similarly dressed, sat at a little distance. The cabin stood within a hundred yards of the German River Main, but the two women spoke not the German tongue. "'I have longed for this day,' said the sick woman, with the longing of the swallow for the southern land when the leaves are gathering their autumn tints. On some sea-girt rock the weary bird might be resting, lonely and sad. The waving palm-trees would beckon her onward to that other shore, but the wing is powerless to reach it. See, the day has come, the blessed Easter day. Protected by the God-fearing Herzog, the Christian flock will unite at the oratory beneath the Würzburg to witness with praise and thanksgiving the baptism of my beloved daughter, my only child. Note on Herzog a lord and leader, literally with the ancient Germans, one who went before them in battle, duke being the modern equivalent. Note on Würzburg, the castle of the Wirt, that is, master of the house and lord of the land. From it is derived Würzburg, changed to Würzburg, the town of our days, on the main. In the course of this story, Würzburg will denote the Herzog's residence on the hill, Würzburg being the distinctive appellation for the missionary settlement at its foot. Reader's Note. The author here uses a difference in spelling which has no effect on the German pronunciation. To preserve the distinction, the missionary settlement will from here out be pronounced as Würzburg. End of Notes. The river flowing past our Cenobi has touched there. Each wave seems burdened with a message to me. The festal time is at hand, I hear them saying. The bells proclaim it from the tower. Come, come, they say, and tarry not. But Belial's mother is lying low in sickness. I feel the shadows of death closing about me. Let not thy heart be troubled, Sister Meshilt, replied her companion, but yield it to the will of God. His thoughts are thoughts of peace and not of evil. In the body thou art absent from thy daughter's baptism, but thy prayers for her may rise to God, 
bringing thee very near to her, even in him. Thou art right, said the sick woman, and death with him is powerless. Christ is the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in him, though he were dead, yet shall live. Iberius, my husband, also lives, though with mortal eyes I saw his face grow white in death. He too, in the spirit, will be with his child. Her father's blessing will descend on her. She ceased speaking, folding her hands in silence, then she continued. My child will be baptized this day, but I enter the gates of death. The sun has risen brightly. Before it setteth I shall be gone. See, the morn is breaking which knoweth no going down. The weary feet are coming home. Ah, weary indeed! How long it is since they began their earthly course in the green isle! How far away! At Armagh, in distant Erin, Achandeca was born. Yes, Meshild would have liked to see the place again where she was called Achandeca, her childhood's home. These all died in faith, responded the younger woman in the words of the Apostle, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Hark, said Meshild, I hear the bell calling to prayer. Leave me, dearest Gertrude, go join our brothers and sisters in the oratory. Leave thee, no, replied the latter. Comforting the sick is no less a service to him than joining with the congregation, and where two or three are gathered in his name, he is in the midst of them. Thou and I may worship him here. What wouldst thou have me read? Thou art kind, Gertrude. The Lord will be thy reward. I would hear the Saviour's parting words to his disciples, as given in the Gospel of St. John. Gertrude, rising from her seat, took a parchment roll from a shelf beneath the thatch. It contained the four Gospels in the Irish language carefully written and partly illuminated. She was just about to begin her reading when the door opened, and a venerable figure entered, saying, "'Peace be with you.' The old man's hair was silvery white, but it was allowed to grow at the back only, the front to the crown of his head being closely shaven. His dress consisted of a simple tunic of undyed wool, and leathern shoes with leggings reaching to the knees. In his right hand he held a chalice, his left bearing the bread. A pouch was suspended from his belt. "'Is it thou, Totman? exclaimed the sick woman, her face flushing eagerly. Comest thou to me, thou friend of my departed husband, rather than join in the service? Yes, sister Achandeka, answered the aged man with a smile. Abbot Coleman has sent me. The stricken widow of a faithful messenger of Christ shall not be left to hunger while the congregation has meat and drink in the house of God. I have come to read the scriptures with thee, and we three will remember the Lord's death as he would have us. It is the worthy abbot who thus thought of thy spiritual need, and his wife has not left thy body to want. A bottle of milk I have for thee, and a barley cake, which she gave me, that thou mayest eat and drink when we have worshipped the Lord. And he took from the pouch by his side a silver flask containing wine, then a stone bottle filled with milk, and the cake in question. The earthly food was placed on the floor, while the wooden log beside the bed served as a table during the communion about to be celebrated. The aged priest, or presbyter, knelt by the sick woman, and having chanted, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. He repeated the Lord's Prayer, to which he added a few words of loving intercession for the maiden who at that selfsame hour was to be received into the church, and having recommended the dying mother to the Lord of mercy, he took up the gospel and read the very words she had longed for, those words of tender comfort which Christ gave to his disciples. He added no sermon to the lesson, but addressed the weary pilgrim with kindly words of sympathy. Their experience had been a common one for many a year. Let me look back with thee to the time, he began, when following Killian, the blessed man of God who has since gone to glory, our little band left the green shores of Ireland to bring the gospel to the poor heathen on this great continent. In the world ye shall have tribulation, said the venerable abbot Bishop Columba as we set sail on our mission, but he could add the Lord's words, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. How truly have we found it so! Our very voyage was troubled and stormy, deep calling unto deep. Our women and little ones, nay ourselves, looked despondingly to the watery gulf. Killian alone kept his faith, believing even as St. Paul believed on the terrible sea. And we were brought safe to land, casting anchor on the shores of Friesland. 
we sailed up the Rhine as far as the Roman colony Moguntia, note, Mainz, where the great German river receives the darker waters of the Main. There we found a Christian settlement, ruled over by Bishop Boeca, or Siegfried, as they call him here, thine own brother. Of him we inquired whither we should direct our steps, anxious as we were to work for the Lord. He advised us to turn our ship's head up the Main to the land of the Thuringians, a fine people, lost in the night of paganism. They were ruled over by their Herzog, Goldsberg, who, although a heathen, was a brave and noble hero. It is just eighteen years ago, it was in the year of our Lord, 685, that we arrived at the foot of the Würzburg. The Herzog received us hospitably, and inquired about our plans. We acknowledged ourselves messengers of the Lord God, the Maker of heaven and earth. We told him we were sent to tell him of a new kingdom of peace and righteousness, established by one in whose name the Gentiles also shall trust, and behold, he was anxious to be taught. He gave us leave to settle at the foot of his Würzburg, between the hillside and the river. There we erected an oratory, our place of worship, built of stone, and around it thirteen wooden cabins, one for the abbot and his wife, and one for each of the brethren with their families, also a common refectory and barns. The settlement was enclosed with a ring fence. The river yielded plenty of fish for food, and we planted a few vines on the hillside, having brought them from Moguntia, that we might celebrate the Holy Communion. And thus we began to preach Christ crucified, finding open ears and willing hearts among the well-minded Thuringians. The Herzog himself heard us often, and gladly, but he would not decide for baptism because his wife, the Herzogin Gaila, strove hard for the heathen practices. For the priests of their false gods, Woden and Friga, Thor and Eor, perceiving the people were inclined to Christianity, had threatened the Herzogin with dire consequences, and she worked upon the Herzog, her husband. It so happened that a horde of Chawari, a wild Asiatic people which had followed the course of the Danube, just about this time broke into the lands and burnt the villages of the unwary Thuringians. Gaila said it was Woden's revenge, because his worship had been neglected, and that the enemy could not be driven back unless Herzog Gottsbert would appease the injured gods by sacrificing the blaspheming foreigners on the forsaken altars. Gottsbert listened to her evil counsel. Father Killian and our brethren Galen and Arnival were seized and killed by the bloodthirsty priests. We others fled like frightened sheep, and for a time lived in the forest, building huts here at Husheim, and not venturing back to the Würzburg. But the Herzog gathered the strength of his land about him, and the Chawari, finding themselves outnumbered, withdrew beyond the frontier. Then he imagined it was the gods who had helped him because of his yielding up the Christian messengers. Yet see, before the year had waned, the Chawari had returned in tenfold numbers, burning and murdering with ruthless fury. The word, In the world ye shall have tribulation, was now doubly true with us, for we were in twofold anguish, terror of the Chawari on the one hand, and fear of the Herzog on the other, being all the time as men on a burning vessel, fire behind us and water beyond. The people from everywhere fled to the Würzburg to the strong enclosure. But how could we go there for shelter, being in bodily fear of the Herzog himself? In that time of distress, when the hosts of the Chawari were within half a day's march of us on the other side of the river, it was Iberius, thy husband, who raised his voice in council, saying, If death be our mead, brethren, let us rather die as confessors witnessing for the Lord, than be killed by the Chawari away from our post. Up, then, to the Würzburg. Let us ask the weak-hearted ruler. Is this the help thou hast experienced at the hands of thy gods? Trust thou in the living God, and he alone will save thee. Thus spoke Iberius the faithful, and we obeyed his voice. Together with many other fugitives we arrived at the Würzburg. Belihild, thy child, was then a babe only ten weeks old. But one of Gaila's men-at-arms, seeing us return, threw a stone toward us as we entered within the enclosure. It hit Iberius, crushing his shoulder. He lingered a few weeks and died, leaving thee a widow and thy babe fatherless. Thus the word came home to thee also, In the world ye shall have tribulation. But thy husband did not die without tasting the fullness of the promise. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It was our abbot who went up to the Herzog, bravely asking the question, What is it thy gods have done for thee, or the blood of the saints thou hast spilt? And Gottsberg trembled. Show me that he whom thou worshippest is mightier than the gods of my fathers, and I will believe, said he. But Coleman made answer, that thy father's gods have availed thee nothing thou hast seen with thine eyes. The living God who made heaven and earth alone can help thee. He can confound thine enemies, and let them be as chaff before the wind. He can do it, if it pleaseth him, but only if thou wilt repent of thy great sin and come to him for mercy. I will but pray thou for me, said Gottsbert humbled. 
I am altogether undone. My men are destroyed. I have but women and children left within the ring fence. Pray for me. I will, replied Coleman, but thou must join us thyself, lifting up thy voice to the Lord of mercy. Night was falling when Father Coleman spoke thus. The Herzog placed watchmen upon the turrets, and returned with us to the foot of the mount where our settlement had been. The cabins were burnt to the ground, but the oratory, the strong stone tower, remained standing. We entered, the Herzog along with us, and now Coleman began chanting the penitential psalms in the German language that Gottswert might understand. Lowly upon his knees he chanted verse after verse, and kneeling around him in deep contrition we repeated after him, Gottswert with us, verse upon verse. Thus we continued, far into the night, the lamp shedding a subdued radiance about us. At midnight the watchman on the tower heard a clattering noise in the valley, as of a host of warriors nearing from the direction of the burnt-down cabins. They listened, fearful of what might befall their Herzog. When the approaching host had seemingly reached the stone tower, the clanking suddenly ceased, as though they were pausing, and presently the watchman on the Würzburg heard a strange rustling from the valley, as of a swarm of cranes rising on their wings, or a herd of deer breaking through the brushwood. It died away in the distance, and all was still. When the morning rose they descended from the burg to look for the Herzog, and behold, the place all round was strewn with spears and battle-axes, left behind by the Chawari in their headlong flight. They had chosen that very night for an attack, and coming forth from the forest they had suddenly seen the soft gleaming light of the lamp burning within the oratory. They had heard the low chanting, and a terror from the Lord had fallen upon them. They had fled truly as chaff before the wind, and no mortal eye in this neighborhood has seen them since. Then Herzog Gottsberg believed and was baptized, having been instructed in the truth as is meet. The Cenobi at the foot of the Würzburg was built up again, and more brethren arrived with Abbot David, to the sore grief of the Herzogin Gaila. We others, with our own Abbot Coleman, returned hither to continue at the new settlement. Thou also didst come back with us to Husheim, leaving behind thee Bilhild, thy little daughter, that she might be taught at Würzburg, in the school which thy brother Edda with his wife had founded there. Thou knowest all this history which I have thus called up to thy memory, for it is thine own history, and yet I told it as though it were unknown to thee, wishing to bring back thy past life to thy inward eye, that, having reached unto the end, thou mayest look upon the road by which the Lord hath brought thee. The ways have been rough, and yet they have been ways of peace, for their end is salvation. Thou knewest it would be so when thou followedst the presbyter and messenger Iberius as his wedded wife. Thou knewest that all earthly pleasure— even this life's happiness must be laid upon the altar, that souls might be won for him from the heathen people who knew him not, and yet are precious in his sight, for they also are bought with a price. But thou wast willing to bear thy part in the blessed work, and the first fruits have been given us. Hundreds of those among whom we spend our life, who were born in darkness, put now their trust in the grace of God which is in Christ Jesus, and have given up all evil practices and deeds of wickedness. Ought we not to return thanks to him, saying, we are not worthy of the least of all the mercies, and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servants. Alas, how often have we been wanting in love, in patience, in faith! How often have we even murmured at the tribulation which we must have in the world, forgetting in our faithless grief that we have every right to be of good cheer through him who has overcome the world! Is the place which he has prepared for us not enough? And as regards this world, Achandeka, is it not more than enough that the Lord has put thy beloved child from her earliest youth into the way of salvation? It is true that to-day it is not given thee to clasp her to thy heart, but art thou not satisfied that thy Saviour will take her to his heart as a lamb to his bosom, while thou art near her in prayer? She will now be made a partaker of the covenant, and for the first time this day she will join the congregation in the communion of his body and blood. And thou too art about to join in this. Repent thee humbly of thy sins and thy many shortcomings, remembering that the bread of life is given to the hungry. Totman knelt down, engaging in a short but earnest prayer which the sick woman repeated after him, and having broken the bread and poured the wine into the chalice, he began slowly and solemnly to chant the communion hymn of the Irish church. Gertrude reverently joined in the singing, while the dying Mechild worshipped her Redeemer in fainting notes. The hymn they sung has been rendered into many of the modern languages of Europe. It presents in clear and lively form the faith of the early Irish church. It is more evangelical in its teaching than might have been expected in that age, and there is ample evidence of the fact that in the eighth century the Irish branch of the church was one of the purest in this respect. The following is a recent translation of some of the stanzas. Salvation given, Christ the only Son, by his dear cross and blood the victory won. Offered was he for greatest and for least, himself the victim and himself the priest. 
He, ransomer from death and light from shade, now gives his holy grace his saints to aid. He that in this world rules his saints and shields, to all believers life eternal yields. With heavenly bread makes them that hunger whole, gives living waters to the thirsting soul. Alpha and Omega, to whom shall bow, all nations at the doom, is with us now. When they had sung this hymn, the aged minister gave the bread and the wine to the two women before him, after which he repeated the Nunc Dimittis, also the Lord's Prayer, and kneeling again he concluded the service as he began it, repeating, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. How shall I thank you for this comfort in my dying hour? said Mechiel, adding after a while. Tell good mother Hilda how grateful I am for her kindness in sending this bread and milk to refresh me, but I think the bread which the Lord has just blessed to me will be the last I shall have need of in my pilgrimage. Earthly food can no longer avail me, the end is near, the eye is growing dim. Ah, my child, had I once more seen thee! The words had scarcely escaped her lips when the door was thrown open eagerly, and a maiden, fair as the morning, hastened to the bedside. "'Mother, mother!' she exclaimed, sinking to her knees by her dying parent. "'Bilhild!' faltered Mehild. "'Is it thou? Can I indeed bless thee ere I go?' She placed her trembling hands on the girl's head, her lips moving in prayer which none but God could hear. The light fled from her face. She lay still in death. It was a happy death, and her desire had been given her. She had seen her child before she went. When Bilhild had spent her first grief, clasping the lifeless hand, Totman asked her gently, "'How was it possible to come so quickly? It is barely time for the service to have been finished.' "'Alas, reverend father,' sobbed the orphan maiden, "'the service was never begun. I am as yet unbaptized and have fled hither for fear of the Herzog in Gila. For God's spirit, the Herzog has died this night.' "'Then may the Lord have mercy on us,' said the old man, adding softly, "'In the world ye shall have tribulation.' End of chapter 1
traveling to and fro in the prosecution of their missionary labors. When a congregation had been formed of the converts, the abbot either himself was its bishop, that is, pastor, or he appointed one of his brethren to the office, in which case the bishop was subordinate to the abbot, who continued as chief guide of the settlement. All these abbots in their turn had a spiritual head in the abbot of Iona, the ancient island church on the west coast of Scotland. Such a mission station was called a cenobie, that is, a place where persons live in community, but never a cloister or monastery. Records are extant, giving trustworthy information concerning these Irish mission settlements, or cenobies. Their center was always the church or oratory. What these were like may be seen from specimens which have survived, as for instance at Devonish and Clondalkin near Dublin, and another on the Flannan Isles. Note, at Altenfurt near Nuremberg is another, erected in the twelfth century by Scottish mission monks. Such an oratory consisted of a round massive stone tower terminating in a high cupola. A circular niche opening out from the central nave contained the simple communion table. The cupola served as a belfry. Each of the brethren took share in the gospel work, and their wives were occupied in teaching, besides their own children, such of the heathen as could be gathered into schools. It would for this reason have been inconvenient if each wife had had the duty of housekeeping besides. The common refectory obviated this necessity, the simple meal consisting chiefly of vegetables, fish, or occasionally game. Among the twelve brethren were generally some not ordained to the sacred work, but who, as serving brethren, with the help of the growing youths or some of the converts, provided for the temporal needs, cultivating the fields, tending the cattle, cutting down trees for fuel, and the like. An island either on a lake or between the arms of some river was a much favored site, affording protection against the sudden attack of hostile heathen, but where such could not be found the mission station was surrounded by a ring fence. The converts usually settled round the Cenobi, gradually forming new congregations. Those among them who were found fit were trained for the ministry or presbytership, in order to assist or, as the case might be, replace the original twelve brethren, or to be sent out that new Cenobies might be founded. Some of these Cenobies grew to be towns, Würzburg on the Main, for instance, as Hammelburg and Arnstadt in Germany, St. Gall and Glarus in Switzerland, owe their existence to those Irish founders, Strasbourg and Salzburg also are indebted to them. Divine service was conducted in the simplicity of the ancient church. There were no priestly vestments, no saint worship, no images, the language used always that of the converted people, the great aim being to diffuse the knowledge of the Bible. In keeping with their mission work, and moreover according to the practice of the early church, was their habit of baptizing their own children, like those of heathen parents, not till after they had been instructed in the Christian faith. Thus Bilihilt had completed her seventeenth year when she was deemed prepared for baptism on Easter Day, the 8th of April, 703. On Easter Eve, when Abbot Bishop David gathered the candidates about him to impress them once more with the sacred import of the intended act, his voice had a tremulous tenderness, and he concluded with these words, Be not slothful in your part, examining yourselves earnestly and humbly praying for the grace of the Spirit that the Lord may find you well prepared, if it be his holy will that we should carry out what we have set before us, be it according to his will. Most of the candidates did not understand why he should have added an if. What should prevent their being baptized? Only one of the young Christians knew the abbot's meaning, a youth of the Herzog's household, named Heimerisch, for it had been he who had whispered news to the abbot which had filled the latter with the gravest apprehension. Something has happened to the Herzog, said Heimerisch. He was found senseless in his chamber. One of the serving women told us that, as she was setting supper in the hall, the Herzogin had suddenly risen from her seat, following a man-at-arms to the bedchamber. That much is certain, that almost directly afterwards Pillum was dispatched to call home our young Lord Hayden, who was away hunting the wild boar. I happened to stand by the door when the Herzogin passed, and she looked at me with terrible eyes. But our brother, the noble Giselhar, charged me to tell you that he intended to be with you speedily. The news was soon to be corroborated. As the Herzog was taking off his armor of buffalo hide, he was seized with apoplexy. His frightened attendant hastened to call the Herzogin, who sat weaving with her women. They laid Gottsbert upon the bed. The right side was paralyzed, and the power of speaking gone. Vainly he tried to express his desire that the abbot should be sent for to pray with him. Gyla knew well enough what he meant, but instead of sending for the abbot she sent for the priest of Bol, a divinity which was supposed to reside in a grove close by. The abbot, though unbidden, had no sooner parted with his young charges than he directed his steps to the burg, to attend to the Herzog's spiritual need, 
but reaching the entrance gate he met the priest arriving from the other side with a handful of holy grasses, and with him Hetzilo, the chief priest of Voden, followed by a boy leading a goat destined to be sacrificed. The heathen priests were admitted, whereas the abbot was refused entrance. The herzog was asleep, he was told, and could not be disturbed. With a heavy heart the aged servant of Christ had descended the hill, and called together the brethren to prayer. They were on their knees in the oratory, and so absorbed in prayer that a young man entered unnoticed. He had a noble, warlike figure, tall and stately. His eyes were blue, his fair hair long and curly. His powdered breast was coated with the usual armor of padded buffalo skin, the legs being cased in greaves of hard leather, while spurs of bronze were fixed to his boots. A heavy iron sword and a wooden sheath completed his accoutrements. His helmet of buffalo hide was adorned with three heron's feathers. He had entered softly and knelt down, joining in the abbot's prayers. The brethren did not notice him till his loud amen mingled with theirs, when the abbot turned to him, almost precipitately, taking him by the hand and saying, "'Gieselhar, what news?' "'Bad news,' answered the young man. "'That our God-fearing Herzog has had a stroke thou knowest already, and the pagan priests, speedily sent for by the Herzog in Gaila, thou hast seen with thine own eyes. I also saw them from the guest-chamber as they entered the inner court by the light of torches, and I saw that Gaila herself led Hetzilo to the dining-hall. I was deeply grieved that this servant of darkness should trouble the dying man with his abominations and followed him on the spot. The Herzogin shot a wrathful glance at me when I entered. She had already brought him to the door of the bedchamber, but I would not be deterred. Lady, said I, what are you about? The Herzog is a Christian, and while he lives his will is paramount, and not another's, not yours, and that it cannot be his will to have his dying hour polluted with devil's work you know full well. Away, thou servant of the evil one, get thee gone to thine own wicked altar. We care not how many goats and boars thou killest there, but thou shalt not hinder the Herzog departing in peace to his lord and master. With these words I took the leering coward by the neck and turned him from the house. Thou hast dared much, said the abbot. Gila's wrath will be upon thee when the Herzog is gone. He is gone, continued Gieselhar. His soul fled while I knelt with him, praying. As for the Herzogin, I fear her not. She is not ruler of the land, but her son Hayden. Her influence with Hayden is great, replied the abbot. Were it not so, Hayden would have come to be baptized long ago. I know, said Gieselhar, and if she had her way, your work among the Thuringians would soon be stopped. But I have taken care of that. Seeing the Herzog had not long to live, I called three Christian and three heathen freemen to his bedside, addressing him in their presence and in the hearing of his wife. Herzog Gottsberg, I said, if it be that you understand my words, and in proof that your reason has not left you, Lift up your left hand, and place it upon this cross. Whereupon his left hand took hold of the cross I held before him, his right hand being powerless. Again I asked, Is it your dying will that Hade and your son shall be Herzog after you? Then testify to it by once more putting your hand upon the cross. He did so. I continued, If it be your last will and command that your son Hayden, as lord of the land when you are gone, shall leave the men of God to continue their holy work in peace, hindering or troubling them nowise, I ask you for a third time to take hold of the cross, and if you are able, confirm your desire with a yes. And behold, the power of God so moved him that with both hands he seized the cross, and with clear voice spoke an unmistakable yes. Thereupon I charged the witnesses, making the three Christian men swear by the cross and the three heathen by their god Woden, that they would testify to what they had now seen and heard, and that they would stand by their testimony before the new Herzog and all the people to the end of their lives. Having thus put them to the oath, I brought them away with me to my own guest-chamber, that by the right of hospitality I might protect them from the evil woman until Hayden should return. "'The Lord bless thee for what thou hast done,' said the abbot, "'but I tremble for thy life.' "'Have no fears for me, father,' replied Gieselhar. "'I am no Thuringian, and owe them no allegiance. I am a free chieftain of the Bemer Vault, and I have come hither, as thou knowest, representing the free lords of the forest in the common cause against the Chawari. Gaila knows she dare not harm me.' and if she should yet venture she would have to answer for it to the Herzogs of Bavaria, who are our true allies and Christian lords withal. As much as the Regensburg, the grand old Roman fastness, out-towers this poor little Würzburg, so much also the power of Teudo and his sons outshines the power of Hayden, for they own the land far beyond the Danube, from the Fichtelburg in the north to the springs of the Isar and the Salzacha in the south. Note on Regensburg. Modern Regensburg. Radisbon. "'And thou gloriest in thy allegiance to Teudo,' said the abbot. "'Allegiance!' returned Gieselhar, almost angrily. "'Have I not told thee I am a free lord on my own land in the forest? "'On the high arch is built the house of my fathers, looking proudly upon the valley. "'If an enemy threatens the land, and the Herzog calls upon the free men to join in defence, "'then I too follow the call. 
but allegiance I owe him none. Thou owest thanks to the enemy, then, for having given thee occasion to go to Regensburg, where thou madest the acquaintance of the holy man Rupert, who brought thee the knowledge of God. I do. It was five years ago, when we joined arms against the Chawari. You know that Rupert is no Scotchman. He is a Frank by birth. Worms on the Rhine is his home. He was a pupil at the Cenobi which our Scottish brethren founded at Worms. It is just about seven years now since he went out from them with twelve fellow messengers to continue the work which Abbot Bishop Erhard had begun at Regensburg some twenty years before. The venerable abbot was thus conversing with the noble youth when the notes of a buffalo horn sounded powerfully from the top of the mount. "'It is the watchman's notice that Hayden has arrived,' cried Gieselhar. "'Let me return quickly, lest the Herzogins circumvent my precaution.' Hayden, having reached the inner court, leapt from his foaming charger, and forthwith entered the great hall, which, together with the retiring chamber already mentioned, formed the central part of the Würzburg. The dismal glow of a torchlight but half dispelled the darkness of the place, the ceiling and wainscoting of which were as black as untold years of smoke could make them. Hayden's looks went searching for his mother. He scarcely recognized the motionless figure which, on a low seat by the idle loom, sat staring into vacancy, paying no heed to his arrival. "'How goes it with my father?' cried Hayden. The figure rose noiselessly, and gliding before him, opened the door to the chamber of death. "'He is gone!' cried Hayden, with fearful emotion. "'He is dead,' reiterated his mother, with icy coldness, "'and thou art the Herzog, but another has forestalled thy orders.' "'Who has dared it?' exclaimed the young ruler, with rising passion. "'Who dared disregard my power?' "'Thy hands have been tied,' said Gila bitterly. "'Gieselhar of the Arch took it upon himself to mark out the way thou shouldst go.' "'He dared it!' cried Hayden wrathfully. "'Who is he to play the Lord here? He shall answer me with the sword.' "'Listen to me first. He has made sure of six witnesses, who will swear to thee, three of them by Voden, and three by the crucified one they call their God, that thy father just before his death had raised his hand in affirmation, when Gieselhar asked him whether it was his last will and command to thee to let these strangers continue their work unscathed. For Gieselhar, in putting the question to him, told him to do so. He understood that much, but the purport of the question was beyond him, I say. "'And what else is of Gieselhar's ordering?' asked Hayden frowningly. "'What else? Is that not enough?' returned his mother. "'Well, he is a Christian,' said Hayden. "'He could not but try to prevent any harm that might befall these men of God.' "'He has dared to order people about here as though he were master,' continued Gila. "'He introduced these six retainers into the retiring chamber, which hitherto has been sacred to any foot save thy father's and mine.' and not satisfied with this, he shut them up in the guest-chamber where they are at this moment. As for me, he kept me away from my dying husband. It was he who received his last breath, not I. But there he is himself, I hear him coming, and his six witnesses with him. Take heed, Hayden, to receive him with due reverence, he will expect it of thee." Gieselhar entered, the six retainers following. "'Go about your business till I require your attendance,' said Hayden sharply to the latter. Then turning to his guest, he added coldly, you might have spared yourself the trouble, Sir Gieselhar. That it was my father's desire to leave the Hibernians unmolested, I know full well, without your witnesses." "'Quite so,' interrupted Gieselhar. He affirmed this his last will and command by lifting both hands, and by a clear yes. I am convinced, noble Herzog, you will honour his dying will, and act upon it." "'Just so,' said Hayden. I will honour his will no more or less than he honoured his father's last desire. Did not his dying father bid him to remain faithful to our gods? And did he act upon it? Since when, Sir Gieselhar, is it meet that the dying Herzog should prescribe for the heir of his power? If it is my pleasure to persecute the strangers and destroy their worship, you will not hinder it by your six witnesses. It is not my pleasure. I desire rather to leave them in peace, not because my father has thus enjoined me, but because I consider it well and prudent. If you had kept yourself from interference, I would not have hurt a hair of their heads. But because you have presumed to play the Lord here, administering oaths to my retainers, introducing them into my mother's very bedchamber, I will let you and them find out who is master here. Conrad, he said, turning to one of his men, go down to the abbot forthwith, and charge him to have no bell ringing, no psalm singing, no worship of any kind for a month to come, because of my father's death. I'll just see if they will not obey me as their lord, and tell him it is my intention to take charge myself of my father's obsequies in the forest. We shall not require their assistance. As for you, Sir Gieselhar of the Arch, I might well turn you from my board for having abused of hospitality. I will not do it. For the sake of Herzog Teuda, who has sent you, you may stay as long as you please." "'I shall not please to make further use of your hospitality, most noble Herzog,' said Gieselhar proudly. Nor was it my intention to tie your hands, but rather to free them." He stepped from the hall, 
ordered his men to saddle the horses, and rode off. Day was breaking. As he reached the Cenobi, he found the little colony in great consternation. Conrad had just delivered his message. "'We cannot obey this injunction!' exclaimed several of the younger brethren. "'It is the will of God that we worship him this Easter day, and we should obey God rather than men.' "'See that ye mistake not his will,' said the abbot. "'It is written nowhere in his word that we should ring the Easter bell. When St. Paul was a prisoner at Rome, he did not keep the days of unleavened bread with the brethren.' He did not say, It is the will of God I should, let me burst from my prison and keep Easter time, but he worshipped the Lord in bonds. Thus ye also are his prisoners now, not shut in and fettered, but shut out from your oratory. Go then to your cabins and worship him in silence, ay, and in tears, if perchance the Lord will turn the heart of the new Herzog, and give him thoughts of peace toward us. And indeed it is by humble obedience that we shall gain most. If we defy this grievous command, the work will suffer." Gieselhar shared this opinion, and the brethren resolved to obey Hayden's behest. Bilahild and the rest of the candidates, therefore, could not be baptized for another month, if then. When Bilahild learned this, she said sadly, "'Could I but go to my mother? Brother Hedo has just brought me word from Husheim that she is sick unto death, and not likely to live another day.' The abbot, hearing this, was anxious she should go, but knew of no safeguard to escort her. "'I do,' rejoined Gieselhar. All the more as it is my intention not to leave the country without bidding farewell to our brethren at Husheim. If the maiden will trust herself to me, I will take her thither in safety." A saddle-horse being provided for her, the maiden set out with Gieselhar, followed by his two servants, old Trudpert and curly-headed Dado. The rising sun had crowned the hills with a purple glory, but Bilihild's tearful eyes sought the ground. She thought of her mother, and the world was dark to her. She was glad to see her once more but the sorrow of this last meeting far outweighed any joy. It was a disappointment to her also to return unbaptized. She rode along in mournful silence, and Gieselhar, whose eyes could not but be charmed with his lovely charge, dared not disturb her grief. His two servants, however, to while away the time, presently fell into a loud conversation, beginning to tell each other mysterious tales of the various divinities worshipped by their neighbors, of Woden among others. Gieselhar, hearing it, turned round. Trudbert, he said reprovingly, how often have I told thee not to speak thus lightly of the devil?" "'Is Woden the devil?' asked Bilihild. Gieselhar was taken by surprise, but said after a while, "'I met a priest one day who had come from beyond the Alps, and he assured me the best means of making the people turn against their heathen gods was to tell them these were just the devil and his angels, who war against the kingdom of light. It seemed to me good counsel.' "'But it is not true,' said the maiden. "'It cannot be right to say what is not true.' Does not St. Paul tell us the things which the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to devils? He also says that an idol is nothing. Judge for thyself, is there a Woden? Certainly not. But there is a prince of darkness, the chief of fallen angels. We know it is deception to tell men there is a Woden. Worshipping him also is deception, which pleases him who is the father of lies. But if thou tellest thy servant, Woden himself is the father of lies and the prince of darkness, thou mayest be guilty of great wrong for hitherto he has thought of Woden as of an old man with a beard of lichen riding on a white horse and sometimes on the wind chasing his faithless wife, and he will be likely to turn the adversary of Christ Jesus into just such a silly spectre. And if the men of God tell him, There is no Woden, and thou addest, Woden is the devil, how should he not come to imagine the teaching of the scriptures no better than the heathen tales of Woden and the like? "'Thou art right,' exclaimed Gieselhar, looking at his companion with undisguised surprise. To tell the truth he had taken little notice of her so far, that she was fair to behold he could not but see, but beyond this he saw in her merely a maiden entrusted to his care, and one greatly beneath him in position. Now to his astonishment he found her a woman to be listened to. Her sad face lit up as she spoke, a wondrous light breaking from her eyes. She was indeed beautiful to behold. He could not but own the majestic loveliness of her whole bearing. "'Father David has told me,' she continued, that these transalpine priests are teaching a strange mixture of truth and falsehood, bewildering the people in Britain, whither they have taken the gospel. In order to gain the heathen in greater masses, they allow them to keep some of their pagan conceits, changing the names perhaps, but condoning the practices. Instead of praying to God on the holy days, as Christian people have done since the Church's earliest time, they call upon saints and martyrs themselves, asking for their intercession in our behalf. Instead of idols they have saints now, offering them worship in heathen fashion, the name only has changed, idolatry has remained, and the latter abomination is greater than the former because it pretends to be Christian. The very sacrifices have remained under the guise of Christian festivals. Our men of God who hate such a mixing of heathen practice and Christian teaching 
who are not satisfied with what is half and half, and will not admit a man to baptism unless he has truly repented himself of his sins, and turned to the Lord with a whole heart, have much to suffer from these priests of the Romish church. They affect to despise our abbots and bishops, because like the apostles they live in holy wedlock, the bishop of Rome himself insisting on what is nowhere taught in the Bible, as though it were a sin in a minister of the church to have a wife. "'What a foolish craze!' exclaimed Giselhar. "'To be sure,' continued he, but stopped short. "'To be sure,' he was going to say, "'if marriage were interdicted in our Irish cenobies also, one need not fear lest one of the brethren should take a maiden to wife who might well delight a man's heart, and whom I would fain gain for myself.' But he considered that Billahild was on the way to her mother's deathbed, and suppressed the thought. Yet knowing he might possibly not meet her again for a long time, he could not help letting her see indirectly what he dared not put into clearer words. "'The men of God,' he said after a while, "'are not forbidden, I believe, to look for a wife beyond their own Cenobi. "'Oh, no,' replied Billahild. "'They may marry whom they please, only of course not heathen girls. Their wives must be true, zealous, and humble-minded Christians. Brother Hookbalt, for instance, has married one of our converts, and found in her a God-fearing wife and a faithful helpmeet in his holy vocation.' "'And I suppose,' said Giselar, "'the men of God would not necessarily expect their daughters to wed a brother within the Cenobi, but one of them might follow a Christian husband to his home beyond, if she were so minded. Indeed, I remember,' he added, "'that only last year a daughter of our venerable Abbot Rupert at Regensburg married a Bavarian husband of Herzog Teudo's household. If we might suppose now that sooner or later a free man, whose home is neither at Hushheim nor at Würzburg, should turn hither the steps of his charger,' hoping to gain Billahilt for his wife, and if she were not loath to accept him, there would be no reason why the two should not be joined in happy wedlock. But, he continued, as the maiden blushingly averted her face, this is no time for such fancies. It is not lover's music, but sounds of mourning which ring in thine ear. I pray the Lord in his mercy to spare thy mother, to grant her the joy of assisting at thy baptism, and to grant me the happiness of knowing the mother of such a daughter. Let it be according to his will, said Billahilt gently, the tears falling from her eyes. Giselhar was silent. His secret thought turned to fervent prayer. If that prayer could be heard, Billahilt's mother would be brought back from the gates of death. And he would not hide from her the wish of his heart. She herself should gain him the daughter's acceptance, and the mother's hand would bless him who in future would be her son, and the rightful protector of her darling child. As his thoughts were thus running on apace, the woodland opened out before them. Another turn, and Hushheim lay open to their view. Giselhar felt his heart beat, but poor Bielehilz was ready to stand still. The solemn notes of the communion hymn rose from the oratory, carried on the wings of the wind. The gate of the ring fence was closed and not unguarded, but the watchman knew the approaching maiden and opened without delay. "'It is well thou art come,' he said. "'Thy mother is at the point of death.'" End of chapter 2 Chapter Three of Billahilt by Julie Sutter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, A Noble Suitor. His grave with the wicked, Isaiah fifty three nine. Giselhar did not see Billahilt again. His sense of honor, as well as offended pride, urged him to quit Hayden's dominions as speedily as possible. He left that same afternoon to return to Bavaria. Billahilt was kneeling by her mother's coffin. Of Giselhar she thought no more. The mortal remains of the faithful Meshilt were taken to their last resting place amid the hymn singing of the Christian people. But the congregation had need to put on the garb of mourning. Sorrow was gathering on the horizon. Gila's influence on Hayden is great, Abbot David had said to Giselhar, and truly it was so. The latter's well meaning interference by Gottsbert's dying bed only served to make matters more easy for the evil minded Herzogin. Hayden was nettled and felt it a point of honor not to be advised by Giselhar, whom he watched riding off with the satisfaction of having shown him the door. But his feelings of dislike to the meddling stranger found vent in a growing hatred of the Hibernian settlers in general, for were they not of the same faith with Giselhar and his trusted friends? The old Herzogin had no difficulty in making Hayden believe Giselhar, after all, had only carried out what had been carefully planned in the Cenobi. But he would hold his own. On Easter morning two of the Herzog's men, fully armed, arrived at the door of the oratory, to keep watch that none of the Christians should think of entering the sanctuary. Gaila, of course, had chosen two heathen for the office, Pilung and Murung by name. They brought a hamper of game with them and a large cask of beer, to fill up the time between the singing of coarse heathen songs. 
Their noise was such that the brethren could not even worship in their own cabins, which none dared leave. In the evening two other spies relieved guard, and their noise was, if possible, still greater. The oratory continued closely watched. In the course of the week the funeral of Herzog Gottsbert took place. Not in the least considering the fact that he had been a Christian, it was under guileless direction, performed according to heathen rites. A pyre was raised in the forest, and the corpse in full armor was carried thither by the departed Herzog's favorite steed. Gaila and her women followed with wild lamentation. Behind them, Hayden, surrounded by all his men-at-arms, even the Christians among them having been obliged to take part in the ceremony. As the procession went through the beech forest, Heimerisch stepped to the side of the young Herzog, boldly addressing him. "'What do you expect the gods will do with your father's soul? They cannot admit him into Valhalla. They will have to send him to hell.' Note, Hades. "'Insolent churl!' exclaimed Hayden, but could add no more, for the reasoning of his Christian retainer was too patent to be gainsaid. Heimerisch coolly continued, "'You have made but poor provision for the departed Herzog. Our abbot would have done better. He would have recommended him to the mercy of God who made heaven and earth, that by the merit of Christ Jesus he might enter paradise.' Hayden looked to the ground in sulky silence. "'My mother insisted on it,' he said presently. "'It is her doing, not mine.' Tell the abbot he shall pray for my father's soul. He waved his hand, and Heimerisch, obeying the sign, left his side. The procession had arrived at the funeral pyre. Hetzilo, the priest of Woden, stood in readiness with his attendants to receive the corpse. But no sooner had Heimerisch caught sight of the ministers of darkness than he turned on his heels, followed by all those among the men who were Christians. Heedless of permission, they returned by the way they had come. Hayden did not call them back. It was the lesser number who remained behind. When Gyla noticed the defection, they were disappearing between the beaches. "'What are they about?' she exclaimed angrily. "'I have sent them on a message to the abbot,' replied Hayden. "'My father, having been a Christian, will not find admittance with the gods. The abbot may as well pray for him to his god, else his soul will remain homeless.' "'Foolish prate!' retorted Gyla. "'He was my husband, and the gods will receive him.' "'Hell shall receive him!' answered the strange voice of a druidess appearing suddenly before the horrified Herzogin as though risen out of the earth. The weird figure seemed of gigantic size as she screamed with glaring eyes and wildly streaming hair. "'Does Gyla think the gods favor her because she is the Herzogin? I tell thee they will not receive thy wicked husband. There is no forgiveness with the gods. They will give him his portion with the children of Loki. The serpent Eormungandr will hold him fast. The Fenrivulf will gnaw away his heart. The wild hell will rejoice at his misery.' "'Hold thy peace, Valda interrupted Hetzilo. Did I not enjoin thee to keep aloof? Wherefore comest thou to disturb the holy rite? Thou didst tell me, cried the druidess, but imaginest thou that Valda is frightened away by an artful priest when the voice of God is within her? It is an ill-advised God that speaks from thee, replied the priest, trying to cover his confusion with an appearance of confidence. Thou knowest not that Goltzbert repented on his deathbed and returned to the gods of his fathers. Thou knowest not that by his own command I am here to celebrate the sacrifice, and offer up the favorite horse to all-powerful Voden. How shouldst thou know that Pilung, secretly following Giselhar the stranger, heard him tell the abbot that the dying Herzog would not listen to his prayer, but ask for me, the priest of Voden? Return to thy cave, Valda. I know thou meanest well, and thinking Gottsbert had died a Christian, thou hast come, lest the service of Voden be profaned. No, it was no god that spoke from thee, but the voice born of thine own thought. The druidess retired sullenly. "'What is this about Pilung?' asked Gaila and Hayden, amazed. "'He can speak for himself,' said the wily priest. And Pilung, stepping forward, affirmed the false tale, making use of fearful oaths. He had been carefully instructed by Hetzilo, whose hatred of Giselhar knew no bounds. He was in truth a cunning man, this priest of Woden. He knew the Herzog had died a Christian, and that complying with Gaila's request to conduct the funeral according to heathen rites was really a profanation of the worship which he pretended to hold sacred. Valda's fanatical imprecations at least were honest. But the crafty priest considered that nothing would be more hurtful to the cause of heathenism than his refusing to receive the body of the departed Herzog, and that nothing would be more likely to injure the growth of Christianity than to re-establish at the Herzog's funeral the religion which he had banned from the Würzburg. This was a triumph not to be forgone. To make it possible he invented the tale, prevailing upon Pilung to swear to it falsely. The most immediate gain was this that any latent desire in Hayden's breast to honor his father's dying will was effectually stifled. Or rather, Hayden now consoled himself that his father's dying wish had been the very opposite from what Giselhar had tried to adduce by his witnesses. Gottsbert had evidently changed his mind after they had left him. 
had not Pilung affirmed his testimony with the direst oaths, raising his right hand and saying, If it be not as I say, let Vodin crush this my right hand which I lift to him. The ceremony proceeded without further interruption. The corpse was placed on the pyre, tied upright in a sitting posture. The favorite horse of the deceased, a milk-white charger, was killed by Hetzilo and also laid upon the pile. Preparations being complete, Hayden set it alight. It was soon ablaze, burning up the corpses of the late Herzog and his steed, while the priests walked round it with dismal dirges. The flames rose to the height of the beech tops, and the suffocating stench was carried by the west wind far into the valley of the main. When the pile had sunk down to ashes, the remaining heap was covered with earth and turf. The sword blade and other bits of metal outlasting the fire were buried separately. When the procession moved homeward, Gyla triumphed in her heart. The story told by Hetzilo and sworn to by Pilung, that Gottsbert had recanted just before his death, was most eagerly received by her. She believed it because it suited her. She herself had been present, seeing and hearing, when the dying Herzog testified to his desire that the men of God should be left unmolested. She had seen him raise his hands. She had heard the yes of the paralyzed man. And when the six witnesses had left him, she had remained in the chamber, sitting apart, but seeing and hearing that Giselhar offered up prayer by the bedside. It is true she could not follow the words, but on the other hand she had seen nothing that could have led her to believe the dying man had interrupted the prayer. Indeed, she knew it was scarcely possible he should have spoken again after that yes, which in itself was almost miraculous, for Giselhar had not been praying many minutes when the breathing became heavier, sinking away presently into the silence of death. Gyla knew all this, and yet she held herself assured of the contrary, for had not Pilung sworn to it, had he not heard Giselhar confess to the abbot that Gottsbert had called for Hetzilo, had prayed to Voden? Surely it must be so. It was not her fault if, sitting apart, she had not heard his dying word. This unexpected disclosure had greatly delighted her. It was a triumph indeed, and she spoke of it to Hayden all the way home. Yet she could not get rid of a secret fear to which the sinking shadows of the night added mystery. After supper, Hayden retired to his own abode in the side wing beyond the court, and Gyla, not without a shudder, entered the chamber in which Gottsbert had breathed his last. She went to rest, but sleep fled her couch. As often as she closed her eyes, she fancied she heard her husband gasping in death and jumped up affrighted. It was turned midnight when at last she slept, but only to be wakeful in dreams. Towards morning, when the rising moon cast a pale glimmer through the trellised window, lighting up the empty place beside her, she started. Was she dreaming? Was she waking? She thought she saw Gottsbert beside her, lifting both hands toward the cross. Terrified, she closed her eyes and listened whether he would call for Hetzilo, but Giselhar prayed an endless prayer and she slept. Now she wandered in dreams through the forest, looking for the pile of ashes, but could not find it. Now to her right, now to her left, she caught sight of Heimersch, leading the little band of Christians back to the Würzburg. She would have flown after them wrathfully, but her feet obeyed her not. In vain she tried to move, when suddenly Valda burst from the thicket, wildly screaming, "'Hell has received him!' and Gyla awoke. She would have influenced Hayden to anything, had she been able. At her bidding he would have chased the Hibernians from his dominions, and would have forced his Christian subjects to offer sacrifice to Vodun. But Gyla, waking, seemed paralyzed, as her feet had been in her dreams. Listless, she sat in the great hall, mute and brooding. Her son attributed it to the grief of widowhood. As far as he was concerned, he never for a moment doubted the story he had been told. It was plain his father at the very last returned to the gods. Giselhar had told him an untruth, and Giselhar had been the mouthpiece of the Cenobi. The pious brethren must be punished. If Hayden did not set about this meditated punishment with a high hand, but bided his time for aggrieving the holy man, it was only that, knowing his mother's feelings in this respect, he felt sure of losing nothing if he waited for her instigation. If she was satisfied to leave the strangers in peace a few days longer, he could be. Of one thing he was firmly resolved. The worship of the strange god should not again be heard in his land. No singing, no sound of bells should rise again from the oratories. Consequently, on the Saturday after Easter he said to his mother, I cannot permit service at Hushheim any more than here. I will ride over this very morning and stop it. Gyla looked at him, wondering. A gleam of satisfaction broke from her eyes. "'Good fortune speed thee, my son!' she cried. He called for his horse and rode from the borg. Gyla had come to herself. Hayden was acting on his own responsibility. What need she fear? He was Herzog and ruler of the land. She could leave matters with him. She rose from her seat and watched her son's departure, till having crossed the river on a ferry he vanished in the forest. "'He is a noble hero,' she said. The spirit of his ancestor is upon him, whose name he bears, and the spirit of Hruoth, the first of our race. 
He will purify the land of these foreign offenders, and we will restore the worship of the mighty gods, of Vorden and Thor, of Fol and Eor. He has taken a weight from my mind. It is not his mother's counsel he needs, but he needs a wife. It is not meet that I continue in the retiring chamber, leaving him to abide in the wing. My hair has grown white with years. It is meet for me to accept the lot of widowhood. Let him bring a blooming wife to the hall. But he shall not think of wedding a daughter of the Bavarian Herzog, who has listened to the strangers and forsworn the gods. Horsa, the Saxon ruler, has a daughter of whom I have heard wondrous tales. At the hour of her birth her father killed ten men and twenty women, offering them up to Frigga. The goddess accepted the sacrifice, blessing the maid with beauty and strength withal. As touched by sunbeams are Ermenfried's auburn curls. She is tall, and sits her horse like a hero. She hunts the elk and the dread aurochs, and throws the millstone farther than our finest men. Of her I will speak to Hayden, that he may go and take her to wife, and a valiant race shall be born of them. As Gyla was thus giving her fancy the rein, Hayden rode moodily through the arching beech aisles of an all but virgin forest. The grand old trees were breaking into the first tender foliage of spring. Here and there some mighty giant, uprooted by the winter storms, lay half buried in the leafy mold, moss growing wherever it had a chance, and the underwood clothing itself with multitudinous buds. The beams of the morning sun shone aslant through the interlacing boughs. Thousands of birds were singing, and a bittern, starting from a sheet of water close by, flew up with a far-sounding call. A doe looked at the rider from behind an elder bush, letting him approach to within twenty steps when she bounded away gaily. A black squirrel ran up the stem of a beech, turning round on the first bough to look slyly at the young man beneath. He laughed and held out a hand to the merry-eyed creature, but it sped away from branch to branch to the topmost retreat, and vanished from his pursuing gaze. Then he examined the track of a stag which crossed his path, and once more turned his looks aloft, delighting in the sunbeams overhead and watching a pair of thrushes as they caroled round their nest. He had quite forgotten that he was on his way to silence songs of another kind. He opened his heart entirely to the influences of the early spring. But hark, there was an echo floating through the forest deeps like a distant harmony. It was the bell of the oratory at Husheim calling the brethren to matins. Wondrously pure was the silver cadence borne to him on the air. It was no unknown sound. Hayden had heard it many a morning in his father's lifetime, who, in years gone by, had often taken the boy by the hand to follow the invitation, and Hayden, by his father's side, had listened with awe to the sacred strains within the oratory. The melodious peal greeting him as he rode towards Husheim did therefore not surprise him. It seemed, on the contrary, a very part of the beauteous morning. The youthful Herzog could not but stop his horse and listen. The calling bell had never seemed so lovely before. He continued listening, almost dreaming, till, startled by a noisy jay, he bethought himself, remembering that these bells were ringing their own death knell, that he would never hear them again, being on his way to forbid them forever. He was startled by this aspect of his intentions. He stopped trying to disentangle his bewildered thoughts and feelings. But before he could recover his serenity he was again disturbed. From behind a rock by the side of his path moans arose so pitiful that he listened aghast. He turned his horse's head to discover the cause and remained transfixed. A maiden of almost heavenly glory, dressed in ample folds of white, lovely as Freya herself, bending over a pale-faced man whose eyes were closed and his forehead streaming with blood. A phial of oil was in her hand. She was just about to dress and bind up the wound, but turned at the sudden noise, meeting Hayden's astonished look with a quiet gaze. "'Who art thou?' asked the bewildered Herzog, springing from his horse. "'As a Valkyr maiden thou appearest before me, about to carry a slain hero to Valhalla. Stay, and do not rise as a swan to disappear from my earthly sight. I am no Valkyr maiden, as thou deemest, said the damsel. I am Belihild, the daughter of Iberius, a man of God who is no longer here. If thou art a mortal maid, how darest thou trust thyself alone in the forest? asked the Herzog, gazing at her admiringly as she turned again to the wounded man to attend to his need. I am not alone, said Belihild. God is with me, in whose service I came hither. In the service of God? repeated Hayden, wonderingly. Who is this man lying wounded before thee? I know him not, replied she, but Damualis believes he is the same Katalt who three days ago tried to set fire to one of our cabins, so that the whole Cenobi would have been destroyed had it not been for one of the brethren who was able to stifle the flame before it spread. And thou returnest good to one who wished you evil? How is it? The boy Damualis, who had gone to the wood to look for healing herbs, found him lying here, wounded and half dead, he ran back to the Cenobi to tell the brethren. The abbot, hearing of it, sent me on at once to look to the poor man's wounds. Two of the brethren are following with the stretcher to take him to our hospice, where he may be tended and recover if it please God. The man who would have destroyed the Cenobi? 
why should we hate him who hated us? He hates us because he is a poor heathen, thinking thereby to please his gods. But our God has told us to do good to them which hate us and despitefully use us. Wilhild, resumed the Herzog, evidently moved, thou sayest thy God is present here. He stopped, not knowing how to continue. When the storm went raging through the forest, shattering the fir trees and the mighty oaks which braved a thousand winters, then indeed the heathen said, Woden is among us, Woden rides atop of the forest, followed by the ghostly hunt. But there was no uproar now. The sacred stillness of the morning spoke of peace only, when a tender maiden could enter securely the lonely haunt, showing mercy to one who hated her people and was an enemy to her faith. Hayden felt the breath of a spirit, of a god higher than Woden. He could not express what he felt, and only repeated, Thou sayest thy god is present here. He is, said the maiden reverently, and it is he who brought you here, most noble Herzog. Dost thou know me? queried Hayden in surprise. How should I not? having often seen you pass the Cenobie at Würzburg. And is it thy God, thinkest thou, who brought me? Canst thou say also for what purpose he brought me? To assist me with this poor sufferer, that you should lift him upon your horse and take him to the Cenobie. He is weak with loss of blood. The brethren, having first to prepare a stretcher, cannot be here for some time yet. And the Herzog did lift the wounded man in his strong arms, mounting the horse behind him. It was strange he should thus approach the Cenobie, actually doing the will of that god whose worship he had come to destroy. Bilhilt followed at an increasing distance. "'Who was it that thus wounded thee?' asked Hayden after a while of the man in his charge. "'Othmar,' replied the latter, "'we felt to blows over a roebuck which he claimed to have killed, though it was my booty.' "'Why didst thou moan so pitifully, just as I approached the spot where the maiden was tending thee?' "'The woman hurt me, drawing the splinter from the wound.' "'The woman?' repeated Hayden. Canst thou not speak of thy mistress more reverently? Is she my mistress? asked Katalt, wondering. She may be before long, said the Herzog, musing, and was silent. Billihild reached the Cenobie some time after Hayden, and was surprised to see the old doorkeeper, Brother Faramund, not only step aside respectfully to let her pass, but bend his head before her, at the same time crossing his hands upon his breast as he would to the abbot, her surprise only increasing when he thus greeted her. Blessed be thy going out and coming in. Arise, fair daughter, and sing a song. She passed him, marveling at his solemnity. When she reached the open place before the oratory, she found the whole of the little community standing about in eager groups. At this she scarcely wondered, the Herzog's presence within the Cenobie, to her mind, being sufficient explanation. But no sooner had she herself been seen when all turned towards her. Her mother's friend Gertrude embraced her, greatly moved, and the aged Taubman coming up said, Bilahil, thou art wanted in the abbot's cabin. She turned obediently to do as she was bidden. The little wooden house inhabited by Abbot Coleman was as simple and poor as any of the brethren's dwellings. When she entered she saw Hayden standing by the side of the venerable abbot. Billahilt, said the latter, the Herzog desires to speak to thee. She looked innocently at the young ruler. I have a question to ask of thee, said Hayden. Thou didst tell me it was thy God that brought me hither. But that cannot be, since it was my own determined will to forbid the worship here, as I have already forbidden it at Würzburg. It is thou who hast turned my will. I cannot tell what mysterious charm belongs to thee, but thou hast made thyself mistress, and I, the Herzog and ruler, have owned myself yielding to thy will. I would say now, if my heart could speak for me, I would continue in thy service. Say, Billahilt, wilt thou be my wife? If thou couldst, I would protect thy faith, and grant the brethren liberty to serve their God for all time to come. Bilihild answered not. A pallor had spread on her face, and when Hayden had ended she lay swooning in Topman's arms. "'Forgive her,' said the old man. "'It has taken her unawares. She is a tender maiden and lowly at heart. That you would have her be Herzogin has frightened her greatly. Bear with her, she will soon be herself again.' Topman carried her to the adjoining chamber, where the abbot's wife cooled her temples with water. Bilihild opened her eyes wonderingly, and a word escaped her lips, so softly none heard it. Kislar she said. "'The Herzog will not depart without an answer,' whispered Totman presently. "'Remember, Billihil, the Lord has put it to thee whether his work and service shall continue here. The eternal welfare of thousands of souls is at stake. Judge for thyself how it would be with us if the Herzog had thy refusal. It was of the Lord's ordaining that he met thee in the forest. It is God himself who requires this at thy hands.' "'I know it,' said Billihil. "'Not my will but his be done, though it be a sacrifice.' 
she rose and left the chamber upright and strong. Hayden stood by the abbot when the maiden came up to him with a brave look in her eyes. "'Most noble Herzog,' she said, "'if with your hand you will pledge me your word that all my brethren and sisters, both here and at Versburg, shall continue in their faith serving God, protected by yourself, if this be your honest will, it shall be as you would have it. I will be a true and faithful wife to you, honoring you as my husband. But remember, my God will even then be present with me." She held out her hand. The Herzog clasped her to his heart, covering her lips with kisses. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Bielehild by Julie Sutter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Mother and Wife. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. Isaiah 42 16. The midday meal was waiting in the dim paneled hall when Hayden jumped from his horse in the courtyard, throwing the bridle to an attendant. Pleasure glowed from his face as he entered stepping at once to the dais at the upper part of the hall, where the table was spread for himself and his mother. Gyla looked at him no less delighted. "'Right glad I am,' she said, "'that with a strong hand thou hast taken hold of the reins. Thou hast no need of my advice, and without fears I may retire in widowhood.' This sentiment met with more approval on the young ruler's part than his mother would have been pleased to know. Hayden smiled to himself as he carved the haunch of venison which had been set before him, but asked presently with apparent unconcern, where dost thou propose to take up thy abode for the future? If I am not mistaken, my grandmother went to the Hammelburg when my father succeeded, did she not?" This was more than the old Herzogin was pleased to hear. When she spoke of retiring she meant to do so within the Würzburg, not to some lonely place miles and miles away. But pride stepping in she said, "'I am ready to go whither the Herzog my son will send me.' "'The Hammelburg,' continued the latter with perfect ease, "'is in good condition, I believe.' but this Würzburg must be thoroughly repaired before I can expect a wife to come to me. How low and dingy is this hall, everything black and—' "'Thou art thinking of a wife!' exclaimed Gyla, delighted. "'The very thing I have wished for thee this morning. And truly she is a glorious maiden whom I have chosen to be thy bride. To Horsa, the Herzog of the Saxons, thou must go. His daughter Irminfried—' "'Thou shouldst have told me of her before,' interrupted Hayden. "'When my father was alive you and he might have proposed the wife for me. Now I am Lord Paramount of the land. The Herzog will choose his bride for himself." "'But he will not spurn his mother's advice,' replied she, with a tone which well betrayed her secret anger, in spite of apparent gentleness. "'I have no need of thy advice. Thou saidst so but a moment since. Indeed, I have fixed my choice. In three weeks, when the days of mourning are over, I hope to lead home the lovely bride to whom I was brought, they say, by God.' The Herzogin looked at him speechless. "'God!' Which God? she was going to ask, but could not, for Hayden continued pleasantly. And much has to be done by then. I must send to Regensburg for masons. They have far better houses there, having learnt of the Romans. Their walls are of stone, the ceilings plastered, and the floor not, as with us, of bare trodden-down soil but covered with flags. In the sleeping chambers it is even bordered. Herzog Teudo also has panes of glass in his windows instead of trellis works. He procured them at great cost from beyond the Alps. I shall hardly be able to get the like, the time being short. However, I will try. If I cannot get glass, they have a transparent stone in Neustria, called Moonstone, which will do as well." Thus he went on till the venison and a dish of pike had been dispatched. Having risen from the table, he called to some of his retainers, who were dining in the lower part of the hall, giving them various commissions with regard to the plans just elaborated. But as he spoke one of the men stepped forward, holding high a birch cup filled with frothy beer, and exclaimed, "'Hail to the Herzog! Hail also to the chosen bride!' The Herzog joined cups with him graciously and approaching the lower board amid the joyous acclamations of the men, he accepted the pledge of each of them. When he returned to the dais, he found that his mother had left the hall. Heimlerisch, commanded the Herzog, follow me. The young man thus called upon attended his master to the little room in the wing, above the stable, still occupied by Hayden. Having reached it, the latter began, I told thee at the time of my father's funeral to request the abbot's prayer for his soul. Now thou shalt go to him and say, he may begin to worship again with bell-ringing and psalm-singing, just as in my father's lifetime." Whereupon Heimerisch folded his hands, exclaiming, "'Blessed be Christ Jesus, the heavenly Lord, who has guided your heart! I never doubted but that you would come to honour your father's dying wish.' "'Indeed, and thou art mistaken,' said Hayden, smiling pleasantly. "'It is the first wish of my bride. 
rather than my father's last desire which I thus carry into effect. My father's last desire, moreover, was not as thou deemest. Alas, said Heimrich, that you should believe it. I have heard the tale concocted by Hetzilo and the drunken Pilong. If it were true, surely your own mother would have been the first to know, seeing she never left the chamber while Giselhar was with the dying Herzog, but she plainly knew nothing of his alleged recantation till Hetzilo told her of it. "'What is this thou sayest?' exclaimed Hayden. "'Is it possible that my mother was present when Giselhar attended my father's deathbed? She never left them together for one moment. She cannot deny it if you ask her. Go and take my message to the abbot. But stop. Send Pilong to me at once.' Pilong appeared presently, staggering, for he had been drinking heavily according to his custom. The Herzog commanded him to give an exact account of the time and place when he pretended to have learnt the secret conversation between Giselhar and the abbot. The churl, gathering himself up, repeated his tale. Hayden sent him back to his work, and mounting his horse forthwith, he rode at full speed to the place where Hetzilo lived in the forest gloom. Hayden roused the priest from his hut, which, like the lair of some animal, was half underground. He requested his account of the occurrence but it tallied exactly with Pilong's. The priest of Woden had been cunning enough to instruct his tool carefully. Hayden could not prove the lie. As he returned he came upon his mother, who was occupied with the lading of a sumpter horse. "'What is the meaning of this?' asked he with surprise. "'Didst thou not tell me the Hamelburg should be my abode? I had better go there at once.' "'Thou wilt go when I have given orders for thy going, and have provided a suitable escort,' said Hayden, quietly but firmly. In two or three days I expect the work-people here, and then I shall have to ask thee to quit the retiring chamber. But there is plenty of room beside. Choose thyself where thou wouldst be, and have thy chattels taken there. Thou wilt not leave the Würzburg before my wedding day. Furious at heart, but outwardly cold and quiet, she obeyed her son's behest. He was ruler indeed. Since love's tender tyranny had seized upon his heart, he had changed entirely. All his being was now bent towards the one object he desired which, influencing his very will, had called that will into activity. He felt himself a man, and felt his power of overruling any opposition to his newly found energy. It had been a fatiguing day, and Hayden retired to his room to enjoy a rest on the couch of bearskins which served him for a bed at night. He did not sleep now, but soon fell into the most pleasant of daydreams, calling back to his mind the charming ride through the spring wood, and the subsequent meeting with Billihild. Her lovely figure, both sweet and majestic, rose before him, he saw her every movement, remembered her every word, and rejoiced in the recollection. And so vivid was the morning's experience to his fancy that he could not be surprised to hear the actual church bell calling the Hushheimer brethren to matins, as in the morning the silvery sounds stole upon his hearing, carried through the wood. But could it be? Surely not, at such a distance he must be dreaming. Yet clearer and clearer the sacred sound arose, not from Hushheim, but from the Senebi at Würzburg, floating past him higher and higher, burdened with the thanksgiving of the whole congregation, which had united at the oratory to praise the Lord for his goodness, and to ask his blessing upon the Herzog. Yes, upon the Herzog and his chosen bride. For Heimerisch was not the first to bring them good cheer, one of the brethren having already sped across from Hushheim, bearing the wonderful news. Heimerisch's message of good will was therefore not unexpected. But if he could not surprise them, he was the more surprised himself when Abbot David acquainted him with the cause of all this happiness and great was the unlooked-for joy of the Christian people at the Borg when he returned to them with the strange account. Tomorrow, he said, she will receive baptism, not at Würzburg, but at Hushheim, where the Herzog has desired her to stay until the wedding. Hayden remained on his couch, listening to the bell as to sweetest music. To him the sounds spoke of Billihild. But the charm was rudely interrupted. Gyla stood before him, pale and trembling with rage. "'It is only of his mother,' she began, "'that the new Herzog demands obedience.' The strangers may laugh at his commands with impunity. "'Who laughs at my commands?' asked Hayden calmly, as he rose from his bearskins. "'I permitted the abbot to continue to worship as he was wont in my father's lifetime.' "'Indeed,' said the Herzogin sharply, "'that I suppose thou spokest an untruth to insult me, when thou didst tell me this morning it was thy intention to stop the hateful thing at Hushheim also.' "'That was my full intention in setting out,' said Hayden. "'But my mind was changed on meeting one of these objectionable people.' and finding that she was actually binding up the wounds of a wretch who had tried to set fire to their very home. Then I bethought me that my father had consulted with the folk-ting, and that the resolution had been carried to grant these Hibernians liberty of worship, that therefore I have no right to act otherwise, as it would be disregarding the desire of the ting itself. Note on Folkting. Assembly of the People. Parliament in Denmark and Sweden is still called Folkting. "'Who was she that made thee think thus?' asked Gyla savagely. 
Belialt is the maiden's name, but why shouldst thou inquire? Thou shouldst rather tell me why my father's last desire was kept from me, why I had to learn from Hetzilo and Pilung that he returned to the gods. How could I tell thee? replied Gila, seeing it was news to me when we heard it from Hetzilo. News to thee? Well, then the abominable tale had to travel by crooked paths. Thou must have been the very first to know, seeing thou didst not leave him alone with Giselhar for one moment. Yet thou didst not learn the strange story from my father, not even from Giselhar, but only through Pilung and Hetzilo, who pretended to have it from Giselhar, though unknown to the latter. It is certainly strange. But I sat quite apart from thy dying father, replied Gila eagerly. How should I have understood his whispered word? Giselhar's ear was bent to his lips. He had come between me and my husband, and Pilung has sworn to it. The six free men whom Giselhar produced as witnesses have also sworn that my father's yes to Giselhar's question had been his last word, death overtaking him almost immediately. I mean to sift this matter. Leave me now. The Herzogin retired, and Hayden once more sent for Pilung. "'Thou hast forsworn thyself, miserable caitiff!' exclaimed the young ruler, as soon as the latter appeared. But Pilung added oath upon oath. Hetzilo had assured him he could swear falsely to any extent, without fear of evil consequences, if only, by way of precaution, the little finger of his left hand were pointed to the ground, while the right hand was lifted in perjury. Hayden, not suspecting the sly tricks of the wicked priest, was misled by the utter confidence with which Pilung challenged the direct punishments of the gods if he spoke not the truth, and felt less sure of his doubts. The old Herzogin in the meantime saw horror upon horror. That the chosen bride of her son was no other than that maiden Belehild, the Christian, with whom he had fallen in on his ride to Hushheim, seemed certain. Now she understood the sudden change in his bearing. It was powerful love which had made an entrance in his heart, and was already beginning to rule his actions. But the thought that a daughter of these hated Hibernians should be the sharer of Hayden's throne and life was more than she could bear, for then it would be impossible to wage successful war against Christianity, to drive away these Irish messengers and pull down their cenobies. She could scarcely hope in that case to keep her son from forsaking the gods, yet this must be her one aim, the sole motive of her actions. She took up her abode in the apartment made over to her, and far from desiring her removal to the Hammelburg, she now endeavoured to secure her residence at the Würzburg, or in its immediate neighbourhood, even after the wedding. Hayden, knowing her temper, expected she would withdraw from her seat in the hall. But when on the following day he obeyed the summons to dinner, he found her at her accustomed place. She rose with the respect due to the Herzog, greeting him with smiles, but made no remark as to the bride he had chosen, nor asked who she could be. Speaking, however, of the intended building operations, she expressed herself interested in all his plans. He was pleased to find she had so soon submitted to circumstances, nor saw he reason to think differently for some time. Belehild had spent the rest of the day on which she had promised to be the Herzog's wife, in tears and solitude, partly in the desolate cabin, partly at her mother's grave. She had yielded up to God the deep secret of her heart, a sacrifice truly, when she accepted Hayden, and now she thought not again of Giselhar, who henceforth was as dead to her. But she thought of the thorny path before her, and prayed God for strength to go along that path in obedience. Her baptism, which was now fixed for the following morning, was to her as the seal set upon this giving up of her person and her life to God, accepting from him the duty he had shaped out for her. Her clear mind had at once grasped the difficulty of her future position. She knew it would require wisdom and circumspection to meet Gila, whom she would have to honor as her husband's mother, without yielding one particle of the firmness she owed to her Christian profession. She prayed God earnestly to give her that wisdom. She knew her weakness, it made her more humble than ever, and this feeling, together with her own desire to be a faithful handmaid of her Lord, left an impress upon her. Yet it was natural the brethren, even the abbot himself, should see in her the future Herzogin, and should honor her as such even now. They could do so all the more sincerely, as it was not so much her future greatness, but rather the nobility of her present bearing which they admired. They could judge of the worth of her resolve. But poor Belehild could not understand why the brethren should thus honor her. It almost hurt her. She bowed her head and raised it again, as though in childlike supplication, before those who had hitherto been her spiritual fathers, and whose prayers, whose guidance, she felt she needed more than ever. Belehild said Totman, her father's aged friend, meeting her one day. Understand me aright. It is not thy humility I would blame. Humility is as the bloom on the fruit of every Christian virtue. But I would wish thee to find thy level on this new path which the Lord has marked out for thee. Thou art to be our Herzog's wife, a princess, raised above us. Humble thyself before thy God, but do not abase thyself before us. A kindly spirit thou shouldst ever show, 
even to the lowest. But such kindness and inward humility need not detract from the honour due to thy position, and which should show itself in thy bearing. It is as the Herzog's wife thou art called upon to enter the Würzburg, not as his inferior. His faithful wife thou shalt be, yea, more than this, the servant of thy God, and a pillar of the faith in high places. I do not say, try to gain over thy husband by untimely zeal. Thou shouldest rather bear in mind what saith St. Peter, Ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Yet there are limits beyond which even thy wifely obedience may not go. Thou must never allow thyself to be kept from prayer, and from the meeting together with the brethren in the house of God, and thou must always be a faithful champion for the Christian people, man or maidservant on the Borg, and especially will it be thy duty to hold thy own, as the Herzog's wife before the old Herzogin his mother. But how shouldst thou succeed in all this, if thou canst not learn to feel at home in thy new position even now? What if the Herzog should come to visit thee, as he may any day? Dost thou think he would like thy bowing low before each one of us? It could not possibly please him. Or dost thou imagine thou couldst change thy bearing all at once? Forgive me, father, said Bilahilt. It is truly a great work I have been called to do. Its very weight has humbled me. But it is to you and the fathers I bowed. I knew I should have to walk differently as the Herzog's wife. Yet thou art right. I cannot learn new ways all at once, and must begin even now. I will try. And she went her way, lowly at heart as ever, but showing again in her every gesture that inborn dignity and noble grace which had charmed Hayden at their meeting in the forest, when he thought she must be a Valkyr maiden of Valhalla. And who is it bursting now from the forest on milk-white charger with the brightly polished copper shield on his left arm? It was Hayden, followed by Heimerish. With a proud look in her eye, Billahilt stood waiting the approach of her lord and lover, and something like pleasure glowed on her brow. The Herzog jumped from his horse in a transport of delight to clasp the noble maiden who, conscious that she was his now, stood holding out her arms. "'I have come at last,' he said. "'I would not come empty-handed, and the Bavarian peddler kept me waiting so long.' Heimerish, meanwhile, was undoing a package which had been fastened to the pommel of his powerful horse, and then followed the noble pair to the refectory, whither the brethren were conducting the Herzog. "'Thou art my bride,' said the latter to Bilihild. "'Let me adorn thee as befitteth her I have chosen.' And suiting the action to the word, he took from the hand of his retainer a costly robe of purple silk, also an ermine cape, bracelets, and a diadem set with precious stones. Bilihild, at Hayden's desire, at once took these things to the nearest cabin, and looked a princess indeed when she returned, clothed in her lover's presence. Hayden rejoiced at her beauty, and even Bilihilt had some feeling as though that future position, which she had accepted with such a spirit of sacrifice, whatever of thorns it might bring, might yield its roses also. A natural delight in raiment belongs to woman. The high-minded maiden could not be accused of vanity, but as a pledge of her lover's affection she did value these pretty things. She felt the happiness of knowing herself loved by her future lord and the duty of loving him in return became easy, all the more so as she found him a man endowed with nobleness of mind and strength of character. The company sat down to their common meal. The abbot prayed the sixty-seventh psalm, to which the Herzog listened attentively. The board was suitably provided. The brethren and sisters, filling several long tables, contented themselves with their usual fare, consisting of oatmeal porridge, vegetables, and dried fruit. But the smaller table, to which, besides Hayden and Billihild, only the abbot and his wife, together with the aged Topman and honest Heimerish, were invited, showed the Senebi could offer something of cheering hospitality. There was a large pike from the abbot's preserves, and a dish of snipe, which the boy Damwalis, by lucky chance, had caught the day before. There was also a cake, cleverly contrived of wheat and flour, milk, butter, and plover's eggs, and, to enhance the charms of the cake, a dish of golden honey fresh from the comb, also blackberries preserved in honey to complete the feast. The Herzog, having had a good morning's ride, did full justice to the meal, Billihilt and the others keeping him company, when the sound of a horse's hoofs broke upon their ears. "'Who can it be, Heimerich?' exclaimed Hayden, but before the latter could reach the door, Pilong presented himself at the entrance, with a well-conditioned roebuck on his shoulder. Catching sight of the Herzog, he showed surprise, even fear. "'What is thy business here?' asked the latter. "'The Herzogin has sent me to deliver this fine roebuck, with her greeting to the maiden Billihilt stammered Pilung, adding with a brazen face, "'I was not told I should meet the Herzog here.' "'Rejoice, Billihild,' said Hayden, well pleased. "'Even my mother has thought of thee with kindly feeling.' Pilung was invited to sit down with the general company. When they had risen from table, Billihild showed the Herzog all over the Senebi. 
he admired the gardens and fish preserves and made friends with the various members of the community. Taking his leave in the evening, he said to the abbot, "'As I am about to carry off a priceless treasure from your Cenobi, it is meet I should give you something in its stead. I herewith present you with the foxwood and the alder grove, together with the meadows between them and the river, to be the freehold property of this Cenobi for all time to come.' And handing over the title deed, he rode away, followed by the faithful Heimerish and the less tried Pilung. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Bielehild by Julie Sutter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 The Wild Hunt. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. Nahum 1 3. Night was falling when the Herzog, followed by his two retainers, set out on his ride. Entering the beech forest, he asked Pilung, Whence did my mother learn who is to be the future Herzogin and where she could be found? She never inquired it of me. Whereupon the man made answer, How should she not know it, since the very birds are heard to sing of Bilihilt? Hayden could not exactly question this, but asked again, Did she know I had gone to spend the day at Hushheim? How should she, since you kept it secret, noble Herzog? But she might have guessed it, seeing me deal with the peddler yesterday. And moreover, added Heimerish, I noticed her this morning watching us from behind her lattice as we rode from the Borg. "'That is not true,' returned Pilong rudely. "'I fear me thy manners have suffered,' replied the Herzog good-naturedly. "'Did the men of God not see to thy bodily wants?' "'More than enough, I should say,' was Heimerish's opinion. "'But he can never have enough, and drunkenness is not pandered to in the Cenobi. "'The more fools they,' muttered Pilong. "'What was that?' inquired the Herzog. "'I did not speak,' replied the churl unmannerly. "'Thou didst, and I insist on thy repeating it,' commanded Hayden. "'Well, then, if it please you to hear it, "'Poor old lady,' I said, "'meaning the Herzogin, your most noble mother, "'you may strike me, scourge me, if you will, "'but I do pity her. "'She is intent only on your advantage, "'and you did not even do her the honour "'of letting her know who is to be the future Herzogin. "'She bears it in silence, without a word of complaint, "'but it cuts her to the heart. "'She has told me she desires to live in peace "'with her daughter-in-law, "'and for this reason she sent her the venison "'as a token of good will. "'But the Herzog treats her, his own mother, as though she were a churl's wife. You mean to banish her to the Hamelburg. She will go this very night if you ask it of her. But I do know. Regisvind, her waiting-woman, has told me that she spends half the nights in tears. It was only yesterday that Regisvind and myself ventured to speak words of comfort to her, saying, Noble lady, the Herzog your son is a gracious master. He is now engaged in repairing the Würzburg. If you were to ask it of him, he would send workpeople across to Gaibach on the hill to restore the building for your abode. You would in that case be near enough for any purpose." or would you rather that we ask him for you? But she said neither yes nor no, repeating merely, it was your desire she should be banished to the Hamelburg, and she would not gainsay you. A Hamelburg is no banishment, said Hayden, frowning. It is a lovely place in the heart of Thuringia. Neither did she call it banishment, added Pilung hastily. It was my foolish pity which called it so. The Herzog rode ahead, musing. If she wishes to dwell at Gaibach, well, I could grant her that desire. I do not want to treat her harshly, she is my mother, and she seems pleasantly inclined to the maiden I have chosen to be Herzogin in her stead. I may as well settle her abode at Gaibach. Heimerich, meanwhile, followed, abreast with Pilum, but the latter averted his face. He would have naught to say to a hated Christian. Whereupon Heimerich began, I fear me, Pilung, we shall have a heavy storm before long. The evening has been unusually sultry, and now I see clouds upon clouds rolling up ominously. This is worse than night. Pilung made no answer, and Heimerish continued after a while. "'Lord, have mercy upon us. The storm is breaking. Hark at the whistling in the treetops and the howling in the rocky caves.' "'I hear,' said Pilung carelessly. "'It is Woden riding across the forest. Thou mayest well be afraid.' "'I,' returned Heimerish. "'No, not I. The living God is my sure defense. How should I tremble at the voice of the storm? If there were a Woden, others might have reason to fear him, not I.' "'Who art thou speaking of?' demanded Pilung savagely. Does thou dare to think of the Herzog? I mean those, said Heimerich quietly, who have sworn falsely calling upon Woden to avenge it. The Herzog, hearing this, turned in his stirrup and saw that Pilung received this remark with a sneer. But just then Hayden's horse stumbled, requiring the full skill of his rider to rein him up and save him from coming down upon his knees. We cannot proceed, he said. We must abide the storm. Darkness had closed in upon them. The pathway, 
which even in broad daylight offered difficulties to the most practiced rider, was utterly impossible now. It would have been foolhardiness to attempt it. A whirlwind burst above them, covering the ground with a shower of broken branches. "'The wild hunt is upon us!' groaned Pilong, aghast. "'We must lie with our faces to the ground that the wrathful gods may pass over.' "'Yes,' said Heimrich grimly, "'and let the startled horses trample upon their cowardly riders.' But Pilung had already suited the action to the word and was lying flat upon the ground by the side of his horse. Had it been less dark his companions might have seen his abject fear in every movement. He positively shook with terror. They also had sprung from their horses, but only to hold them by the bit and speak to them reassuringly. "'Dost thou expect me to hold thy horse as well as mine?' exclaimed Heimrich. But Pilung answered amid groans, "'I must lie flat on the ground. Had Silo said so, then Woden cannot hurt me.' "'Woden harms none who swears by him truthfully.' interposed Hayden, even though they stand on their feet. Jump up, Pilong, and attend to thy horse. I cannot, I dare not, moaned the terrified coward. Hetzilla warned me to lie flat on the ground and let the right hand clutch the earth, calling upon Hertha's protection. Then the wild hunt will pass over and leave me scathless. How terribly it roars! And he groaned in anguish. It was indeed a frightful uproar, tearing through the forest, snapping trees asunder as though they were saplings. Such was the commotion the Herzog could scarcely hear his own voice as he made answer to Pilung. "'Well mayest thou fear for thy right hand, remembering how thou didst raise it in perjury at my father's funeral, saying, Let Voden crush it if I have told a lie.' "'It is safe,' cried Pilung. "'He cannot hurt it.' "'But God Almighty can hurt thee,' said Heimrich solemnly. And scarcely had he spoken the word when a great beach came down with a terrible crash. Hayden and Heimrich had barely time to jump aside, dragging their horses after them. They escaped safely but not so Pilung, who now lay yelling, half buried beneath the crushing weight of the fallen tree. As they turned, a sheet of lightning for a moment lit up the scene. Pilung's horse lay crushed to death beneath the beech tree. Pilung himself appeared to have his left arm free, and was trying to extricate his right hand, which had been caught by the tree. Flashes of lightning, having once begun, went on now in rapid succession, accompanied by terrific roars of thunder. The forest seemed one mass of fire. "'His arm is broken, the hand is frightfully mangled,' said Heimrich, having examined the wounded man by the glare of continued flashes, the Herzog adding wrathfully, "'The gods owe thee another bolt for perjuring thyself a second time when I sent for thee to my room.' "'Ah, no! Spare me!' screamed the unfortunate man. "'I will hide nothing. I did swear falsely from beginning to end, as Hetzel had taught me.' "'And it is thy wickedness,' said Hayden, "'which has brought all this trouble upon us. Who knows but we too must perish. Call upon thy god, Heimrich. Perhaps he will save us. I cannot call upon him.' and my own gods who have just now proved their power upon Pilung have little cause to help me, for I fear me I have done little to please them. Noble Herzog, said Heimrich solemnly, it is not the gods, but the one god who made heaven and earth, who has thus shown his power upon this man, because he perjured himself, bearing false witness against his kingdom. He is the god who hath his way in the storm, and whose fury cometh forth like fire. To him I will call that he may keep you safe. But methinks there are others praying for you even now. Hear you not in the pauses of wind and thunder the voice of the ringing bell? Even now the men of God are on their knees in the oratory, and Bilihilt among them, calling upon God to hold you safe. Yes, Hayden heard it, heard it ever and anon amid the rolling thunder, sweet and pure as on that Easter morn. Poor little bell, what availeth thy trustful voice against the raging commotion? Even now the forking fire shoots from the heavens. Yet strange, the hungry flashes touch not the spot where Heimrich knelt in prayer by the side of his herzog where Pilung lay chained in agony. Rivers of rain presently flooded the ground. The bursts of thunder came at greater intervals, but amid the rustling rain floated the silvery sounds speaking of Bilihilt to Hayden's ear, and away into the valley rolled the voice of thunder. The little bell had had the victory. Hayden stood touched to the heart. But the bell also died away into silence. Rain continued. The enclosing darkness left not the faintest chance of light. "'How shall we succeed in freeing the wretched man from his position?' asked Heimrich. "'And how shall we succeed in finding a way home?' returned the Herzog by way of answer, at the same time trying to peer into the hopeless night. It was vain. They could not guess at the direction even where a path might lie, and had they seen, they would probably have found it barred by fallen trees. It was a most helpless situation. "'But what is this? A nearing radiance in the far depth of the night, now brighter, now gliding among the shadows. White garments lit up by torches presently appear amid the trees, now hidden for a moment, now more vivid, gaining upon the distance. "'It is Coleman the abbot with some of the brethren!' exclaimed Heimerich, after a moment of surprise. "'They have come to bring you help!' When Coleman and his companions reached the place, 
and found that both the Herzog and Heimerisch had escaped the storm unhurt, they broke into loud acclamations of praise and thanksgiving. "'But what has become of Pilung?' they asked. "'There he is, all but dead for his perjury,' replied Hayden. The brethren at once turned to the unfortunate man, setting themselves to free him from his painful position. Pilung had lost consciousness, but the touch to his fractured limb was enough to revive him. He started with a scream of agony. As soon as this had subsided, the Herzog, bending over him, said sternly, "'Tell me, is it true, that story of thine of a conversation with my mother? If it is true, then swear to it.' "'Swear! No, no, I cannot swear!' cried Pilung, full of horror. "'Then tell me the simple truth. All this tale of pity for her, and that proposal of Gybach as her residence, is merely thy repeating what she herself has told thee?' "'It is, it is! You know everything, most dread Herzog! You see in darkness as though you had Woden's eyes!' cried Pilung adding after a while. And she sent the roebuck to deceive the low-born wench and her lover, she said. I could swear to it. Well, I believe thee without an oath, said Hayden. As for the lies thou hast told me before, I might well have the tongue plucked from thy head, but thou hast ample punishment for all thy misdeeds. And addressing himself to the rest of the party, he continued, What advice have the brethren to give me? We must be about halfway between the Würzburg and Hushheim. Whither had we best direct our steps? We will escort you to your own borg said the abbot. We can spend the rest of the night with our brethren there, and return to Hushheim to-morrow. I would gladly accept this proposal, were it not for Bielehild, who ought to know we are safe, objected the Herzog. Then two of the brethren shall return at once, decided Coleman. The rest of us can show you the way. The two having been dispatched, two others tried to make Pilung walk between them, but Heimerisch would not hear of this. He is too weak, he said. Lift him to my horse, Brother Valdo, and mount behind him to support his arm. I will take the lead with a torch. Slowly and cautiously the little company moved through the wood, picking their way amid the ruins of the storm. It was long past midnight when they reached the foot of the Würzburg. Pilung was given over to the charge of the Senebi. His arm had to be amputated. On the following morning, Hetzilo also lost his right hand by the Herzog's command, and Gila was banished to the Hammelburg. End of chapter 5《ビリヒルド》by Julie Sutter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six: Ill Weeds Grow Apace. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. John three six. The day had come on which Hayden brought home his bride. According to old Thuringian custom, it was on a Tuesday. The Herzog had invited the nobles from the country round about to be present at the wedding. They and their retainers accompanied him to Hushheim in grand procession. Some of his guests were Christians, others more or less well inclined to Christianity, while most were anxious to uphold the worship of the gods. As far as the wedding was concerned, this offered no difficulty. In the early time of the Christian religion, marriage was a purely civil act, in which the church had no part beyond the congregation's prayer for a blessing on the couple, on the Sunday following the ceremony. By degrees, however, the custom obtained that a Christian couple stated their desire to marry one another in the presence of a priest, who, having witnessed this, added his blessing. Hayden and Billihild, having already expressed such a desire on their part in the hearing and knowledge of Abbot Coleman, had no need of doing so a second time. When the Herzog arrived at Hushheim to fetch his bride, he was met by Coleman and Totman at the entrance of the oratory, where the united congregation had prayed for a blessing on the noble pair. Totman, having been the oldest friend of Billihild's father, led the maiden to her husband. Before quitting his hand, Billihild sank to her knees, asking the old man's blessing. Hayden would have done likewise, but felt reproved by the frowns of his heathen companions. Totman, nevertheless, whose right hand was laid on Billihild's head as she knelt before him in her bridal wreath, included the Herzog in the blessing, praying God to grant him wisdom in ruling and strength at all times to confess and stand by the truth as far as might be given him to see it. "'May she be a true and faithful wife to you,' he added. "'The Lord hath brought you together, and what God hath joined let not man put asunder.' The Herzog had come with rich presents to the Senebi. Droves of kine and sheep had followed the procession, and were now made over to the community. But the brethren and sisters also had taken care that the bride should not go empty-handed to her husband's house. A wagon stood in readiness, drawn by bullocks decked with garlands. The wagon was to convey Billihild's humble dowry, left her by her mother, and added to by the community according to their power. There was a goodly store of homespun wool and linen, a spindle and distaff wreathed with flowers, a bedstead of maple wood and furnished with bear and rose skins. But the greatest treasure which the men of God could send with the bride to her new home was that gospel book of which Gertrude had read to Billihild's dying mother. 
A bridal feast had been laid in the refectory, for which the herzog himself had provided the choicest venison. When the meal had been partaken of, the Christian maidens accompanied their sister Billihilt as far as the ring fence, which enclosed the Cenobi. She took leave of them tenderly, bidding a wistful good-bye to Totman and the true-hearted Gertrude, and having mounted the palfrey provided for her, the young herzogin rode away by the side of her husband, and followed by his noble retinue. The path leading through the forest had been cleared by Hayden's orders. Near the rock where he had first seen Billihilt, the boy Damoalis and Catalt, who had recovered from his wounds, stopped their passage, holding a rope between them as they stood one on each side of the path. The herzog laughed, throwing a coin to each. Damoalis and Catalt caught his gift with a merry shout and allowed them to pass. Catalt's hatred of Christianity had vanished under the loving treatment he had received at the hands of the brethren. He was being instructed in the truth, and he loved the boy Damoalis, to whom in a measure he owed his life. When the bridal procession came forth from the beechwood, the bell at Würzburg proclaimed the joyful event. Abbot David and his brethren stood waiting their approach by the river, and sang the forty-fifth psalm, while the bridal party with horses and wagons were ferried across. When they had landed, the abbot stepped up to the noble pair, offering them his greeting. "'The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in, from this time forth, and even for evermore." Hayden thanked him, waving his hand, but rode on at once. Halfway up the mount, where the approach to the borg was guarded by outworks, the herzog's retainers awaited their master. They also stopped the passage by holding a rope across the path. When Hayden had paid the expected toll, the heathen company struck up the usual wedding song, which the Christian bride could not listen to without a blush. She closed her eyes, and could have wished to close her ears as well. But painful as this incident was to her feelings of modesty, she soon forgot it in the more painful expectation of meeting the old herzogin. As the company entered the inner court, she looked anxiously about her, fearful of seeing the fanatical heathen, in whose alleged kindly disposition toward her she reposed but little faith. Hayden noticed her inquiring gaze, and said quickly, "'My mother has retired to her widow's abode at the Hamelborg. Bilahilt turned to her husband with grateful eyes. His words had removed a heavy weight from her heart. But great was the surprise with which she now looked about her. The burg seemed a marvel of repairs. It was higher than before. The old shingle roof had been replaced by an elevation covered with chalk stone. In fact, it now was a splendid edifice to her inexperienced eyes. Her astonishment could but be added to as she entered the hall. How high and airy! The walls and ceiling whitewashed and decked with garlands of oak leaves. The hall, formerly so dark and dingy, was positively bright and cheerful. The herzog had succeeded in all his endeavors, to the windows even. From the far-off town Lutetia, note, Paris, in the country of the Westrasian Franks, he had procured small plates of pellucid feldspar, which, fixed in lead after the fashion still seen in old church windows, admitted the daylight very fairly, and though somewhat yellow of appearance, were certainly an improvement upon the mere lattice. In the upper part of the hall dinner was laid for the herzog and his newly married wife, three successive tables below being prepared for his guests, his retainers, and the servants of the Borg. The former, according to old habit, on laying aside their swords, would have thrust them crosswise into the floor, but the bare earth now was covered with flags. With evident annoyance they returned the swords to their sheaths. "'Things have changed now from what we and our fathers have been accustomed to,' said Tjotbert, one of the heathen guests, loud enough for Hayden to hear. "'But by Tresco surely we are not denied the bridal march.' "'No,' returned Hayden, "'you shall have your desire,' and taking his hat he tossed it toward the dais whispering to Billihilt, "'Throw thy shoe after it.' Billihilt hesitated a moment, not knowing the dance and its preliminaries, or whether she as a Christian ought to join. She looked imploringly at her husband, and in doing so accidentally caught the eye of Heimrich, who stood behind him and gave her a quick nod of encouragement. Thereupon she took her right shoe and flung it after her husband's hat. But Hayden had seen the glance, and said with evident displeasure, "'Thou hast no need to consult my retainer. I ask nothing that goes against thy faith.' and taking her by the hand he opened the dance, the guests by pairs joining in procession to the anything but melodious sounds of a buffalo horn. "'It was not to Heimrich I looked for an answer,' now whispered Billihild, "'but to you, my husband, it was mere accident that my eye caught his.' "'I rejoice to hear it,' said Hayden. "'Thou art never to forget that I am to be nearest and dearest, and thou must look to me in everything. Have I not parted with my own mother, lest she should come between thee and me?' Billihild pressed his hand gratefully. The slight shadow of misunderstanding had vanished, the wedding feast ran its happy course, and Billihilt watched the merry dancing of the humbler portion of her husband's household, which terminated the festivity. Happy weeks followed. 
Steelhilt's new life was not so full of thorns as she had anticipated. Hayden loved her passionately and did what he could to please her. He never interfered in any way with the practice of her religion. He even began by accompanying her every Sunday as far as the Cenobi. But he never entered, and she wisely forbore pressing him to join in the worship. Nor did she know that the real reason of his going with her was a feeling of jealousy lest she should have an opportunity of entering into conversation with his Christian retainer Heimerish. But judging presently that his jealousy was altogether unwarranted, he gave up accompanying her, and she walked to the Cenobi with those of the women servants who were Christians. She showed unvarying kindness to all her servants, Christian or heathen alike, and practiced great forbearance with the ill habits of the latter. Her daily duties were much the same as would be expected nowadays of a well-to-do farmer's wife. She had been carefully trained in the Cenobi, and she set about governing her women with great tact and firmness. But every morning before entering upon the day's labor, she gathered the Christian women servants about her to read with them a portion of the gospel and to offer up prayer. The Christian retainers and men servants soon listened to this daily worship, gathering one by one at her window. When she noticed their attendance, she begged her husband to allow them a place of meeting where they might unite in prayer amongst themselves. Hayden gave the solicited permission. One day a heathen maidservant, to whom the young mistress had shown loving care and illness, expressed her desire to listen to the reading in the morning. Bilahild, of course, gave her joyful leave. The Herzogin also did not forget to visit the poor and sick about her, making no distinction of religion, if any needed her aid. She never pressed Christianity upon the heathen that thus came under her influence, but neither did she forgo any opportunity of showing that her religion was the living source of the self-forgetting charity which she practiced among them and whenever she discovered that a case of illness was being treated with heathen sorcery, she insisted on the latter being given up if she should continue with her remedies and her prayerful attendance. And she soon found to her great delight that her heathen neighbors valued her kindness, and rested greater confidence in her means than in the charms and jugglery of the artful priests. Some of those she thus came into contact with even begged her to give them Christian instruction, but she always referred them to the Cenobi. Thus her Christian influence spread about her, quietly but surely. Only one seemed altogether untouched by it, and that was he who witnessed most of Billyhilt's purity, gentleness, patience, and loving obedience. Hayden kept his word as a man of honor, granting protection and full liberty to all Christian people about him, and showing kindness to both Cenobis, more especially to that at Hushheim, but it never entered his mind to assist at any opportunity of Christian worship. He fully approved of his wife's ways and doings. He was even proud to hear her spoken of everywhere with love and veneration but he never entered into conversation with her concerning the respective merits of her religion or his. Some months had passed when Pilum, having recovered from his accident, returned to the Borg. Hayden could not fail to notice a marked change in his life. He never saw him intoxicated, never heard him swear. His very countenance seemed clothed in truth and honesty, instead of the slyness of expression which had formerly disgraced it. But seeing him join the Christian men at morning prayers, the Herzog asked, astonished, whether he too had forsaken the gods, and Pilung answered, I have learned to serve the true God, who found me in the forest and brought to light my falsehood. Ah, noble Herzog, you also were a witness to his finding me and giving me the wages of my sin. Will you not acknowledge him to be God? I have not asked you to preach to me, said Hayden, turning his back upon him. Nor was it altogether surprising. Hayden loved not Billyhild for the sake of her faith, but he showed kindness to those who were of her faith, instead of hating them as before, for the sake of Billyhild whom he loved passionately. It is true he could not forget that this love had come to him on seeing the maiden show kindness to an enemy when he felt the breath and beauty of another spirit than the gods he knew. But that grace of heaven-born charity, which is more than mere earthly love of man and woman, was to him only an additional charm enhancing the sweet picture which had so suddenly filled his soul. For Billyhilt's sake he could put up with that god who was near to her, present with her, her god but not his. It was enough for him if through her he enjoyed the protection of that god, if in answer to her prayers he partook of his favor. It was enough for him, he thought. That his wife's god must become his god was an uncomfortable idea, for he felt that he too in that case would have to change much in his own life, that he would be obliged to yield up his own will in many things, and accept the teaching and admonition of the men of God, and that was more than his pride could brook. Neither did he consider conversion to Christianity a wise proceeding in the light of worldly wisdom. Most of the highborn in Thuringia and beyond it were still in the bonds of heathenism, so much so that when his father was prevailed upon to accept baptism, many of his noble followers threatened to leave him and join the Saxons. It seemed therefore politic to keep the former state of things, as far as he was concerned. 
let the men of God first succeed in Christianizing the land, then he too might consider the advisability of becoming a Christian. Pilung, having lost his right hand, and consequently become unfit for labor in the ordinary sense, was now generally employed in running errands. One day he was dispatched to the Hommelborg with a letter for the old Herzogin. But so much afraid was he of meeting her, that when she admitted him to her presence in order to give him her answer, his looks showed so little of that peace and honesty of countenance now general with him, that Gaila, knowing nothing of his conversion, saw no change in him beyond his being maimed. Ha! she cried, I fear me both Pilung and Hetzilo had to pay dearly for a false oath. Woden took thy right hand, and my son took Hetzilo's. But why dost thou quake in thy shoes? I do not blame thee, and I am sorry for thy mishap, and I pity thee for having to live in a house where the gods are treated lightly. Lady, said Pilung, but she cut him short, continuing, And what about my precious daughter-in-law? I hear the people think much of her. She has turned their heads as she turned my sons with her arts. But there will be an end of this soon. I may as well tell thee, for thou knowest how to be silent. The heathen nobles throughout the land will no longer put up with the Hibernian strangers. They are going to give the Herzog his choice, either to send away the low-born minx he has made his wife, and drive all these Christians from the land, or else they will turn from him and join the Saxons, and he will rue it. Do not interrupt me, I tell thee, before ye are many months older, banished Gyla will have had her revenge. Now get thee back with this letter to my son." She turned from him abruptly leaving Pilung altogether startled by the revelation she so imprudently had made to him. But no sooner had he recovered himself than he sped on his way, running day and night to acquaint the Herzog with the news. Hayden was greatly enraged on learning the treacherous intentions of the nobles in question. But instead of being led to embrace Christianity and to act openly and boldly toward his adversaries, he hoped to gain over his faithless followers by cowardly concession and unjust treatment of his most faithful friends. He wrote letters of appeal to the heathen nobles, denouncing any suspicion that he could enter the service of the strange god, calling to witness the fact, which was true enough, that he had never once been seen to enter the oratory. If his wife was a Christian, well, that was his business. He had found her in everything else his true and faithful wife, and if he allowed her and the Hibernians in general to serve their god in peace, it was no more than the folk thing had agreed to in his father's lifetime. Thus he wrote to the disaffected nobles. But to his mother he sent an invitation to take up her residence at Gaibach thus apparently meeting her cherished desire, while in reality he was anxious to have her near enough to watch her. That she too in her turn now could watch him, he considered not. Heimerish very foolishly expressed his disapprobation of this step, as he was out hunting with his master. "'I am grieved you should have thought so little what the Herzogin may have to bear in allowing your mother to return to this neighborhood. "'Did my wife charge thee with a message to me?' retorted Hayden, nettled barely listening to his retainer's assertions that she had never breathed a word to him, either concerning this trouble or aught else. The result was that the very next day Gyla was invited to the Würzburg. It was the first time that the two women met. Bilihild had prepared herself to accept with patience whatever show of spite or hatred Gyla might show her, but the artful woman went up to her with the most fawning deference, flattering her after a manner which could only rouse Bilihild's horror of falsehood and interspersing all this with constant hints of the respect due to the wife of the Herzog. The noble truthfulness of Billihild could not accept so false a means of intercourse. She retired within herself. She was silent, appearing cold and proud, the very result Gyla had hoped for. Hayden noticed his wife's reserve, and resented it. Gyla presently mentioned her own father, and that he had been a Herzog in Saxon lands. Billihild could have answered that her father too had come of noble, even royal stock but she spurned the satisfaction of vain boasting, and bore the imputation that accounted her as of mean birth. Gyla spent the night at the Würzburg, to return on the following morning to Gaibach. That evening, Hayden informed the Herzogin that morning prayers must be stopped on that day, as it would be a great offense in the sight of his mother. As for Gyla, he watched her closely, and indeed he had plenty of reason for mistrusting her. But his very fear of her intrigues made him anxious to consult her desires he hoped to disarm her by speaking to her mind. "'It is strange,' he said, "'that the gods should have punished that deceit which Hetzilo meant to practice in their honor. There is Pilung, who took Woden to witness of his false oath, and behold, Woden crushes his right hand. How should one doubt the power of the gods?' That Pilung himself had come to disbelieve it entirely by accepting Christianity, he did not tell his mother. He had, moreover, considered it prudent to dispatch Pilung on several days' errand before inviting Gyla. But more than this— he stopped morning prayers once for all. Those who cared to pray might do so by themselves, he said. Bilihild obeyed. The thorny path was opening before her. She saw Hayden's affection for her cooled visibly. 
Whole days he would now spend away from her out hunting, or shut up in his old apartment, where he dispatched whatever business of administration or jurisdiction required his attention. During the first months of their wedded life he had never failed to consult her, glad that she should share his thoughts and occupations. Now coldness and reserve had taken the place of open trust, and he all but repented of having married a Christian wife. Love seemed buried and gone. Cause for annoyance, no doubt, was amply at hand. His hopes of conciliating the disaffected nobles by turning against his Christian friends had failed, and before long he was surprised with the unpleasant news that Harsa, the Herzog of the Saxons, had invaded the land, and that numbers of the heathen nobles had joined him. Messengers were dispatched in all directions. The people were called to arms. Preparation for war was the one topic of the day. "'In another week we shall be ready to take the field,' said Hayden one evening, having inspected the warriors that had gathered round him. When he retired for the night he found Billhild in tears. "'What is the matter?' he inquired. "'How should I not weep?' replied she. "'When I see you depart for cruel war, shall you return? My heart is full of fear.' "'Thou wast different when I first knew thee,' returned he impatiently. "'A brave maiden, I thought. I hate a whining woman. I had rather have thee pray for me as thou didst on that night when the wild hunt was upon us in the forest.' Do you think, my husband, that these tears prevent my prayers? Yes, truly, I will pray for you, day and night, without ceasing. Yet it is not the same thing whether prayer be offered in happy trust or with a heavy heart. I do not understand thee. Bear with me, my husband. The Christian's prayer is not like a charm by which God in heaven could be forced to do our will. He is the Lord Almighty, holy and just. What availeth all my prayer if he will not hear? And can he hear it, bless and protect one who— having had such powerful evidence of his nearness and saving mercy, has never yet owned him to be God, nor desired to be taught his law? I have kept my word, said he gruffly. I never interfered with the Cenobi. I have done my duty. To us, yes, but not to yourself for your own salvation. Whose protection will you rest in? The true God of the Christians you will not serve, and the heathen gods you no longer believe in. Who told thee I believe not in our gods? Leave me alone with thy preaching and he turned from her. Before Hayden took the field, he had a meeting with the Bavarian Herzog, Poido. It was important for him to renew alliance with this powerful ruler, who could act as a strong bulwark in the south, should the Chawari avail themselves of his absence and repeat their attack. Poido being a Christian, Hayden hoped to gain him the more easily if Billhild, his Christian wife, accompanied him. The meeting was to take place halfway between Wurzburg and Regensburg. Hayden arrived with his wife and a numerous retinue, to make up which his Christian subjects had been chosen by preference. The homesteads of two freemen were the appointed quarters, one for the Bavarians, the other for the Thuringians, the free space in the middle being the neutral meeting ground. The two rulers with their retinue entered almost simultaneously at opposite sides. Billihild was at her place close by Hayden, but no sooner had she raised her eye when she grew pale and trembled. It was but a moment before she recovered herself but her emotion had not escaped the Herzog. He looked about to discover the possible cause. Among all whom they had come to meet, there was but one whose unexpected appearance could trouble Billihild, being the only one who was no stranger at Wurzburg, Giselhar of the Arch. Poor Billihild had indeed been fearful lest Giselhar should be of Herzog Toido's company. How gladly would she have withdrawn her own presence, but she could not, dared not. How could she have told her husband, prone to jealousy as he was, that she had met this Giselhar once before, and that for one short hour his memory had lived in her heart. Had she not sacrificed whatever of tenderness she had felt for him on the altar of her wedded troth, transferring all love to the husband that had been given her? And if she trembled now, it was not that she had hoped to meet Giselhar again, but because she had feared doing so. Transactions began, soon engaging the young Herzogin upon more pressing realities, and in a measure calming her fears. A treaty was arrived at, but Toido, in agreeing to it, had stipulated that during Hayden's absence the Cenobes and the men of God, as well as their worship, should not in any way be interfered with, and that in the case of interference by anyone they should always have free appeal to Toido himself, as guarantee of their liberties. Hayden very naturally raised objection upon objection to this point, but with a courage and decision he had not looked for in his wife, Bielehild said, "'I consider this clause of vital importance.' Without it my husband's mother will leave no stone unturned in her endeavors to destroy the Christian faith." The time had come when the Herzogin, remembering the duty pointed out to her by the aged Topman, must stand by her Christian subjects, even to the claiming of her right as the Herzog's wife, against Gila, his mother. 
she saw it was her divinely appointed position to become a bulwark of the faith in high places, as Topman had said. She would not fail in her calling. Had she not brought her very heart to the sacrifice, even to the yielding up of life's happiness, and should she not now grasp the object of that sacrifice, in spite of the look of hot displeasure darted at her by her husband? Business over, he returned with her to their quarters. His first word on being alone with her was the question, "'Where didst thou meet Giselhar before?' She returned his burning gaze calmly, and said, "'It was he who brought me from Würzburg to Husheim on Easter morn, when I was called to my mother's dying bed.' "'If that is all, why didst thou start at his sight?' "'I was fearful lest I should meet him again, and it troubled me.' Hayden paced the floor in silence, wondering whether it could be merely the recollection of the mournful occasion of their first meeting which made the second undesirable. But far from feeling satisfied, he asked presently, placing himself face to face with his wife, did he make love to thee when you met before? In sooth the time would have been ill-chosen, she replied, adding after a while. It is not fair in my husband to question or doubt me. Is it not enough that I have come to you a pure handmaiden? If you required a wife which had never looked upon man before, you might be prepared for disappointment. And she turned from him, indignant and hurt, trying to hide her tears. At this moment Heimerich appeared, announcing dinner. Herzog Toido awaited their company. Hayden could not delay. Bilahild begged to be excused, but Hayden would not hear of it, saying she must in any case appear at his side. Whereupon she dried her tears and went. Giselhar, being a free lord, had his place at Toido's own table, and Bilahild found him sitting opposite to her. "'I little thought,' he began, as soon as he had the opportunity, "'that I should meet you again as Herzogin. This was hardly to be foreseen when I accompanied you to Husheim on Easter Day. Indeed other thoughts seemed nearer then, and who knows?' Had your mother not been dying, who knows but that another might have stepped in between you and your present honours. "'Indeed,' returned Bilihilt coldly, "'methinks I should have been the first to consult, not you nor another, and it seems to me your conversation is ill-befitting a Christian man as I take you to be.' And she dropped her eyes with marked displeasure, allowing him not another word. But he had noticed she had been crying, and from all he had seen and heard besides he had gathered a tolerably correct estimate of her position. She is made unhappy, he said to himself, not only by her fanatical mother-in-law, but also by the jealous temper of her husband. She married him, hoping to further the interests of Christianity, and now she feels it a sacrifice beyond endurance. But why has he married her? For some sudden love which did not last? It is plain she is no happy wife. I must watch her. But Hayden, too, was drawing conclusions. How brazen-faced of the man to own in my very hearing that he entertained thoughts of her, and who knows but he does so still? and how anxious she was to silence him, lest I should hear more. It is plain to me they love one another, and fool I am to believe her true to me. And, I bethink me, did she not swoon in very anguish when I first asked her to be my wife? But I shall know how to keep them apart." The following morning the party returned to the Würzburg. No sooner arrived there than Hayden sent for his mother, requesting her to take her abode in the Borg during his absence, in order to keep careful watch upon Bilahilt, lest at any time she should meet with Giselhar who, he doubted not, would soon put in an appearance. "'Now I understand,' he said, why she was so anxious to place the Thuringian Christians under Herzog Toido's protection. She hoped it might open a way for her old lover to come and go at his pleasure. He then demanded Bilhild's faithful promise that under no pretense whatever would she leave the Borg until he returned. "'I shall go every Sunday to the Cenobi,' said she, "'and I shall read and pray every morning with the Christian servants here. I claim the right of your given promise.' The Herzog was furious, but Bilihild remained firm, though otherwise patient as a lamb, and not answering a word to the wicked hints of the evil-minded Gila. Hayden saw he could not prevail. "'Then give me your word at least,' he cried, "'that you will not go farther than the Cenobi while I am away.' "'This I will promise,' she said. "'I am well content with the liberty of joining worship in the oratory, and ask no more.' This settled, the Herzog sent a message to the Cenobi, requiring the abbot's oath that no visitor should be admitted during his absence. This is interfering with our lawful rights," said Abbot David, and went to speak to the Herzog himself. Arrived at the Borg, he met numbers of Christian nobles, who had joined Hayden's cause. These, upon hearing the Abbot's grievance, went in with him to the Herzog, saying, "'Unless you give your word to the Abbot that both Cenobis shall continue in full liberty, even now in your absence, you may go to war without us.' "'Is it not foolish, O Herzog,' said Ruadbert, their spokesman, "'to alienate your Christian friends?' It is the heathen nobles who have turned against you. We Christians are true to our allegiance. Why should you thus grieve us?" 
Hayden saw he was helpless unless he agreed to their demands and gave the required oath. Gila too, was forced to swear she would keep the peace. At night, Hayden retired to his solitary chamber, and when Billihild woke in the morning, her women told her that the Herzog, with all his host, had departed. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Billihild by Julie Sutter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Patient in Tribulation. I know how to be abased. Philippians 4.12. Shortly after Hayden's departure, Gila took up her residence at the Würzburg. She was followed by her attendants, men and women, all of whom, of course, were heathen. But more than this, a number of heathen priests returned with her bringing up wagons containing all the utensils considered needful for pagan sacrifice. Within a few days the whole aspect of the Borg was changed. Billihilt, her women, and a few aged retainers were the only Christians left. These were rudely pushed aside while the heathen, priests and all, ruled the place. Gila at once took it upon herself to play the mistress, Billihilt submitting in silence. But her worst time was at meals, when Gila taunted her with all manner of insult in the hearing of the assembled household. Thou wilt soon return to whence thou camest, she said. When my son comes back, he will separate from the low-born creature who is no better than a beggar. Thou shalt have leave then to join thy lover Giselhar for aught we care. I have no lover save the Herzog, said Billihilt proudly, and if you care to know my descent, I am as nobly born perchance as my husband. My father's uncle was king of Dundalk. Gila burst into a mocking laughter. Dundalk, she cried, and where may this kingdom be, as large as our dairy farm, I warned me. He was a free lord of his clan, such are called kings with us. "'I perceive,' sneered Gila, "'that is why the free lord Giselhar could so easily become king of thy heart. Birds of a feather I see, but when the Herzog returns thou shalt be put to the fire ordeal. If thou art as pure as thou wouldst have us believe, thy feet can walk upon the burning embers scathless.' To such language she treated her day after day. Poor Billihild was scarcely able to eat for sorrow and grief. Her health began to suffer. She saw that she and her hopes would perish if this continued. She consequently refused to appear in the hall, and retired to one of the spare chambers, where at least she could have peace, requesting to have her meals served there. Gila sent her the remains of the servants' table, but Billihild was satisfied. In the morning she continued to gather the few Christian people about her, to read the gospel with them and unite in prayer which alone could uphold them in trouble. But the little congregation was often obliged to take refuge in a small garret room behind her chamber in order to get away from the yelling which the heathen servants made a point of striking up before Billihilt's window whenever they thought her engaged in worship. The wild singing of coarse songs in honor of the heathen gods in itself was a trouble to be borne, and whenever the Christian servants ventured abroad they were reviled and buffeted. They could but remember what their lord had said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. It was on the second Sunday after Hayden's departure that Billihilt, at the head of her little flock, left the Borg amid the scornful laughter of her adversaries. She was on her way to the Cenobi some time before the bell began to call to worship, and thereby gained her object, which was to secure half an hour in which she might unbosom herself to the faithful abbot, telling him her grief and receiving his advice and consolation. She found him alone in his cabin, and was in the midst of her tale of sorrow when the door of the adjoining room was flung open, and Giselhar burst in, who, having heard of her trouble, could no longer restrain himself. "'For heaven's sake!' she exclaimed, terrified. "'How is it that you are here?' I have come on Toido's business," replied he. I arrived last night, intending to watch from here how Gila fulfills her oath. This is the way, then, in which the woman keeps her promise. Very well, I am here now, and I will teach her better. For God's sake, do not interfere, cried Billihild, unless you mean to ruin me entirely. She has not yet troubled our worship here, and her treatment of myself is of no consequence to you. Billihild, said Giselhar tenderly, there was a time when thou didst not use the you in addressing me. Canst thou not trust me as thou didst then? Thou hast joined thyself in wedlock to this heathen, meaning to do well, but the great sacrifice thou hast brought for the Christian cause has availed thee nothing. It grieves me beyond measure to see thee suffer. Ah, Billihilt, I have not changed since then. Indeed, I honor and love thee all the more. This union with a heathen is no marriage. It cannot be binding. By the word of the apostle thou art free to depart from him who first departed from thee, giving thee over to thine enemy. St. Paul says, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, and also— a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. Come with me, I will take thee in safety to Herzog Toido's court, and he himself will procure thy divorce. 
that I might be free to marry you, said Billyhilt scornfully. Truly a tempting offer, but I say to you, get thee behind me, thou art an offence unto me. I have taken my oath not to leave the Würzburg while my husband is absent in the war. But quite apart from this, it needed not an oath to make me choose the path of duty. It is not true that Hayden departed from me in the sense you would have it. And the Apostle says, The woman who hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. I am his true wife, and I will keep him the faith I have pledged him before God. Tempt me not to dishonor the name of Christ, be false to his people, and lay them open to the Herzog's vengeance. The men of God are under the special protection of Herzog Teudo, said Giselhar. He can keep them safe better than thou couldest, and they are further protected by Schildebert, the powerful king of the Franks, who is united under his scepter Neustria, Burgundy, and Austrasia, and who will no longer allow these Thuringian Herzogs to play the part of independent rulers, considering they have been obliged to acknowledge the supremacy of the Frankish kings for nearly two centuries now. No, Billihild, it needs not thy sacrifice to keep the men of God safe. Why shouldst thou suffer these things? I have but one answer, said Billihild. Nothing will happen to me but what is the will of God. Yet one word to you, Giselhar. You say you love me. I crave not your love, but I may well ask for Christian charity. It was your foolish, unguarded behavior the other day which caused my husband to put me in charge of the cruel Gila, lest I should meet you in his absence. If you will add to my sorrows, you have but to remain here. But if you have a kindly feeling for me, I pray you leave the country before Gila becomes aware of your presence. Or, if this is against Herzog Teudo's command, at least take your abode at Hushheim and not at Würzburg. Yes interposed the abbot now. Let this be your decision. It is enough. The bell is ringing, and I must enter the oratory. Thou, Giselhar, shall remain in my cabin, and I forbid thee to show thyself to any one. I myself will take care to see thee to Hushheim in the night. Giselhar, having both the abbot and the Herzogin against him, retired as he was bid. Bilihilt accompanied the abbot to the oratory, and after hearing the word and partaking of the Lord's Supper, refreshed and strengthened in spirit, she left the Cenobi with her companions, to enter with a willing heart upon another week of sorrow. But arriving at the Borg she found the household gathered in the court, evidently intent upon what news they could gather from one in their midst. Bilihild went nearer, if possible, to hear what he had to say, when to her intense delight she saw it was Pilung himself, Pilung who had set out with the expedition, and who had now returned, dispatched by the Herzog after battle. Pilung, she cried, what of my husband? Ah, the Herzogin herself, exclaimed the messenger. To you I am sent with news of a great victory, which the Herzog, with his Christian followers, has won over the rebel heathen. But enter your own hall, noble lady. It is to you in the place of honor that I will deliver my message. If others like to listen, they may hear that none of the heathen rebels escaped. Gila retired to her room, but Billihild once more sat in her rightful place in the hall, the people gathering about her, while Pilung, mounting a stool, delivered himself of his report. The Herzog had safely crossed the Rhone, and was passing through the valley of the Vestra, when his scouts returned with the information that the whole array of the enemy, the Saxons, together with the disaffected Thuringians, had been seen on the bank of the Horsula, beyond the forest. The Herzog then took counsel with his faithful nobles. Some were for climbing the mountain, called the High Suona, from the fact that justice there is delivered to the people, and from that height to make a descent upon the enemy. Others again were afraid of an open battle, because the enemy was far stronger than we. They were rather for enticing them into ravines and hollows where numbers would not avail. The Herzog took position upon the Suona, with his vanguard. Then Heimerish spoke to me. Pilung, wouldst thou do good service to the Christian cause? Yes, said I, and should it cost my life. Then exchange thy warrior's coat, he said, for a peddler's jerkin. Let me batter thee about a little, that thou mayest have a few scratches to show. Go down into the valley of the Horsula, and get thee into the camp of the rebel Thuringians. Tell them Hayden and his vanguard are on top of the Suona, that one of his men had thus beaten thee. They will ask thee about his force and thou shalt say truthfully that the body of his fighting men are still behind, that he alone with twenty nobles and their followers had climbed the mountain. I did as Heimerish told me. I easily distinguished the Thuringians from the Saxons, and told them as I had been bid. They decided at once to surprise the Herzog in order to make him prisoner, and commanded me to show them the way. Now I must tell you that there is a ravine in the slope of the Suona, worn through the rock by water. It is so narrow that two men cannot pass it abreast, and so deep that the sun never reaches its bottom, the rocks towering high right and left. Up this path I led them, saying they could thus reach the top unseen by mortal eye. As they went up the defile, Heimerich, according to our arrangement, with some of his party, descended through the forest and took his position behind them at the foot of the ravine. The first of them, meanwhile, having reached the top, I told them to go straight ahead and they would soon come upon the Herzog. But at this moment our brave nobles were upon them and their defeat was complete. Those which had not yet left the defile turned their backs and fled, pursued from the top, but there was no escape at the bottom. 
Heimerich and his followers received them man by man as they emerged from the ravine. Most were killed, some were taken prisoners. The Herzog had by this time been joined by the great body of his fighting men, and when he heard what Heimerich and a handful of Christian nobles had done he was loud in their praise. One of the prisoners escaped. He fled into the Saxon camp to announce what had happened. They hastily rose to arms, but Hayden and his force were upon them, attacking them from different sides. It was a bloody encounter, but the Saxons were defeated. Hayden pursued them to where the horse joins the Vestra. There they gained their ships, and moreover the night closed in, else not a man would have escaped. The Herzog dispatched me to bring you the news of this great victory, which the Lord hath given him, and he bids you to hold the men of God in loving care. That was a sunbeam to Billy Hill's heart, while Gila saw but clouds on the horizon. Hayden's heathen enemies had been annihilated. He had been revenged on them by his Christian followers. It seemed pretty certain what his future course would be. But the first thing which Billy Hilt now did was to gather her Christian people about her to offer up thanks. There was no noise now to disturb their worship. When it was near dinner time, Gila sent two of her women, begging Billy Hilt to join again the common meal in the hall, promising she should in no way be molested. Billy Hilt hesitated a moment. Her Christian humility would have complied with Gila's request, but upon reflection she saw that the latter would only presume upon her forbearance. She replied, therefore, she would continue to take her meals in solitude. Then Gila grew alarmed, and made a point of sending her the choicest morsels. But the old Herzogin's wicked heart soon beat more lightly. Her maiden, Regisvind, had whispered to her important news, nothing less than that Giselhar had been seen at Hushheim. Aha! said Gila. If Hayden cannot be brought to hate her for her religion's sake, he will do so for her infidelity. It is plain there is some understanding between her and Giselhar. What else should be the reason of his presence while my son is away? But we will watch them. I shall not prevent her meeting him in the Cenobi. On the contrary, I shall be glad if I can prove it." And behold, the very next morning, the maid Regisvent came to Billyhilt, expressing an unexpected wish to join the Christian worship. She was anxious, she said, about her soul, and desirous of knowing more of Billyhilt's God. The young Herzogin doubted her sincerity, but gave her leave. She chose the story of Ananias and Sapphira for the morning's portion, adding a few solemn words as to the power and holiness of God before whom no falsehood could live. Regisvent trembled a little, but she continued to attend prayers. Two or three days thus passed peacefully, but then came a night of grievous woe. Billyhilt was roused from sleep by the buffalo horn from the tower. She knew it meant alarm, and dressed in haste. A horseman arrived, voices were loud in the courtyard, and as she opened her shutter a cry of horror passed from mouth to mouth. "'The Herzog is dead! Dead!' they cried, and Billyhilt sank in a swoon. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight: Trouble and Escape For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. » Psalm 59, 3 The Saxons collected their force on the other side of the Vesra, and seemingly retiring along the bank of the river, they recrossed and doubled upon the enemy, with the view of attacking him in the rear. Hayden, meanwhile, and his army ferried over on rafts, but finding the Saxons had quitted the ground, he too returned to the right shore, intending to push northward the following day, when, lo, he found himself overtaken by the foe, coming from a direction where he least expected them. The night had been chosen for the attack, and had it not been for Heimerich's vigilance, their success would have been instantaneous. Faithful Heimerich, suspecting the sudden disappearance of the Saxons, would not leave the safety of the camp to the ordinary night watch but posted himself with his bugle on an eminence beyond, keeping a careful lookout, aided by the growing moon. His ear caught the nearing sound of horses' hoofs, and presently his peering eye saw gleams of moonlight reflected on copper helmets. He gave the alarm which roused the camp. The Saxon vanguard was close in sight, but Heimerich kept his post, well knowing that the hill was too important a position to be lost. His incessant bugle call was the signal for urgent help. The Thuringians, understanding the import, hastened towards the hill but the first of the Saxons were already upon him. Heimerich closed with three, who succumbed to his mighty strokes, but five more are ready to attack him. Jumping sideways, he succeeds in separating them, gaining the victory upon them also. He sees the Thuringians at the foot of the hill, if he can but hold out a few moments longer. The host of the enemy is upon him. Heimerich's sword, as a blade of lightning, flashes in all directions. He bleeds of twenty wounds, but his object is gained. He sank in death when the Thuringians came up behind him, and made good the position for which he gave his life. 
The intention of the Saxons to force their adversary into the river was thereby frustrated. They now pushed upon the camp where Hayden, with a number of his nobles, received them. He succeeded in dividing them. One part was driven back on the hill and finally dispersed. The others retreated more orderly, and having crossed the Vesper by swimming, made preparation there for a final stand. Hayden ordered his troops to be ferried over, but this process was somewhat slow, as only a certain number at a time could thus get across, the Herzog being among the first, that he might dispose of each succeeding batch as they arrived. The Saxons were ready for an attack sooner than he expected, and pressing down upon the shore, they effectually hindered the further landing of the Thuringians. The Herzog, heading his little band, tried to oppose them, but the weight of the enemy drove back his followers upon the river. He found himself left alone with a few of his men, vainly trying to gain a retreat. Some Thuringian nobles, perceiving his strait from the other side of the Vesra, attempted to reach him by swimming, but they were still in the water when the wild shouts of the enemy announced that help came too late. Hayden had fallen, struck down by the blow of a club. The few men who had been able to stand by him to the last were disarmed and taken prisoners. The Thuringians saw how the victors stripped the Herzog of his helmet, shield, and sword, but lost sight of the body in the confusion which followed. The right shore of the Vesra was in the hands of the Saxons. Nothing remained for the Thuringians on the other side but to retreat and gather their force among the hills. Hayden's retainers, who had fallen into the hands of the enemy, were even now being butchered as a sacrifice to the war-god Eeyore. Thus ran the woeful tale. Poor Billahilt shut herself up in her chamber, weeping and trembling. Gyla had triumphed. Hard as a flint she had listened to the news of her son's death, but turning to Billahilt she had exclaimed wrathfully, "'This is the god's revenge upon those who turn his heart from their service!' Hayden had a cousin who owned a borg in the Rome. He was not a ruler to be desired, lacking even ordinary capabilities, but he was a heathen, and for Gyla that was enough. He must be chosen Herzog, said Gyla to herself. That this would require some manipulation she knew, for the remaining nobles, most of whom were Christians, the heathen having fallen in the first encounter, would stand by Hayden's wife. It was necessary, therefore, to get rid of Billihilt before they returned from the war. And Gyla had prepared her means. If Billihilt was accused of infidelity to her husband, she must be brought to the fire ordeal, and as no one could be judged innocent by that ordeal whose feet were not made of clay or stone, it would be easy to prove her guilt and ensure her death. But the charge of infidelity could easily be founded upon the evidence that she had met with Giselhar. And moreover, had she met with him lately in the Cenobi, how should it be proved that such meetings had not taken place before? Gyla and her priests had laid their plot, and while the faithful nobles were absent, there was none to prevent its being carried out. On the following Sunday, Regiswind joined the number of those who accompanied Billihilt to the oratory, and so true seemed her attitude that Billihilt, having seen her tears, invited her after the service to come with her to the abbot. Little did she think who, in spite of all her prohibition, was again present in the cabin. Gyla anxiously awaited Regiswind's testimony. No sooner had she returned than she was required to give it. "'What hast thou seen?' asked Gyla. "'Has she met with anyone?' "'Giselhar was with the abbot.' said the waiting-maid, but your suspicions are ill-founded. No babe could be purer than our Herzogin. We had not entered the cabin when the abbot met us, exclaiming, Retire, noble lady, unless you would meet him whose presence is hateful to you. What? she exclaimed indignantly. Has he dared to show himself again, though you and I forbade him the Cenobi? He says, replied the abbot, that you are free of your oath now, the Herzog being dead, and that no law, either human or divine, prevented your listening to his suit. He prays you to accept his protection in your present state, and allow him to take you safely to Herzog Tordo's land. "'Tell him,' replied the Herzogin, "'I charge him once more to leave Versburg, or I myself will ask my mother-in-law to consider him a prisoner. If he is here on his master's business, he should have brought his credentials to the Versburg, instead of hiding himself as a wrongdoer.' "'I cannot blame you,' said the abbot, "'yet you speak in anger, noble lady. You forget the dangers awaiting you on the Borg, and should not spurn lightly a protector like Giselhar. "'I need no protection save God's,' returned she. What right indeed has this Giselhar to count upon my accepting his unwelcome suit? I have seen him but twice in my life, once in the presence of the Herzog my husband, and once when he took me to my mother's dying bed. I own I did not dislike him that first time of our meeting, and if the Herzog had not come between, who knows but what I might have listened to him, but now I thank God who led me otherwise, for now I see he is but a man who is guided by his own selfish will, rather than by Christian duty. He knows what I have suffered innocently on his account and yet he expects me to follow his desires no sooner than my husband is dead, lending color thereby to the very suspicion which persecuted me and shamed my Christian calling. I say no, and I repeat, unless he leaves the land immediately, I myself will apprise my enemies of his presence. 
Thus spoke the Herzogin, and leaving the abbot, she returned with me to the Borg. "'Were any of her women present at this conversation?' demanded Gaila. "'None but myself,' said Regisvind. "'That is lucky,' rejoined Gaila. "'Thou wilt swear to the priests that thou overheardest her secret whispering with Giselhar, and that she has agreed to his carrying her off to Toido's land.' "'I will never give such testimony,' exclaimed Regisvind indignantly. "'What, should I betray the innocent Herzogin? That may be work for a heathen, but not for a Christian woman as I am now.' "'Thou a Christian!' cried Gaila, clutching her by the arm. "'A pretty story, indeed!' "'I am,' repeated Regisvind solemnly. "'You have commanded me yourself to join the worship of God. You have brought me within reach of the fire which has quickened my conscience and brought light to my darkened soul. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but it is blessed to become his child and taste his love. Oh, if you could have heard the Herzogin pray for her husband, recommending him to the mercy of his Redeemer, and if you could hear her intercede for you, that you might receive grace and forgiveness of sin. Sin! Dares she charge me with sin, the impudent beggar? And thou, graceless minion, darest thou repeat it to my face? screamed Gyla, beside herself with rage, and ill-treating the poor girl till the blood streamed from her nose and mouth. I'll teach thee to know thy betters and obey my will. You may beat me, kill me if it be your will. I can die for the truth, and for our dear Lady Bilihild, replied the brave girl, and swooned away under Gyla's cruel hand. Gyla, having spent her fury, stopped to consider. What if the waiting woman, who evidently had become a Christian, should betray her intentions, proving them by the very lie which Gyla had just attempted to put into her mouth? That must not be. Regisvind must be silenced. The old Herzogin, having sent for two of her priests, informed them that the girl had forsworn the gods and should therefore be made one of the victims at the great sacrifice she intended to offer up to Woden in memory of her son's death. And poor Regisvind, waking from her swoon, found herself a helpless prisoner in a hole underground. She knew the place, and that it was used for those only who were destined to be slaughtered in honor of the gods. She knew her fate, but was willing to yield her life, accepting a baptism of blood for the baptism of water that should seal her covenant. Bilihilt missed her at prayers the following morning, but none of her women knew anything about her. Had Gyla sent her away? Or had she fled to the Cenobi, fearing Gyla's anger? Or again was her conversion mere pretense, thought Bilihilt, not knowing what to make of her absence. But explanation was given by Gyla herself, who entered Bilihilt's chamber on the Tuesday, saying, "'Tomorrow we yield sacrifice to Woden on account of my son's death. Regisvind is one of the appointed victims. We shall expect thy presence. Thou shalt join the procession. The path must be strewn with raven's feathers and mistletoe by thy hands.' "'I shall not join the wicked show,' said Bilihilt, starting in just anger, "'and no harm shall be done to Regisvind.' "'Not without thy permission, perhaps?' sneered Gyla. "'No one has asked thee for it. Thou wilt do as thou art bid.' "'You forget,' said Bilihilt, "'that you will have to give an account to the nobles when they return from the war. "'They are far distant now, and who knows how many of them will return. "'The Saxons advance victoriously. "'Meanwhile it is thy business to yield obedience. "'I am mistress here, as thou seest.' "'She turned and left her. "'Bilihilt fell to her knees and called to God for help.' She resolved to retire at once to the Cenobi for protection, but going to the door she found it barred and locked, two of Gyla's men keeping watch below. And again she fell to her knees, earnestly praying for strength to bear and strength to withstand, for peace and sorrow and submission to whatever her god would have her bear. She considered the past, and felt comfort in the thought that she had not listened to Giselhar's suit. "'It is blessed,' she said, "'to suffer innocently.' Night came, but she was left in darkness. She lay down on her couch, dressed as she was, and so peaceful was her heart in answer to her prayer that she slept like a child. She woke, hearing a gentle knocking, which seemed to come from the garret room beyond. Reflecting that no one could have entered that room save through her own chamber, she thought she must have been dreaming. But the knocking was repeated, and a deep voice whispered presently, "'Open the door, noble lady. It is I, Pilum. I cannot find the latch.' She undid the bolt and stepped aside, waiting for an explanation. She could not see him enter, for there was no ray of light. She scarcely heard his cautious advance, but again he whispered, "'Flee, noble lady, the way is prepared. I have loosened some planks in the outer wall. Flee, flee at once. Regisvind is imprisoned to be slaughtered to-morrow. I too am a chosen victim, and a more terrible fate awaits yourself.' "'Where are my women?' asked the Herzogin. "'They have escaped, and await you anxiously by the river.' "'And where is Giselhar?' "'Alas, that he had not left,' said Pilung dolefully. "'He would be a strong arm in your defence.' but he disappeared on Sunday, none could tell whither. "'The Lord be praised,' whispered Bilihilt. "'Do not tarry,' urged the faithful Pilum. 
and he led her to the passage he had made, where a rope ladder hung suspended. They reached the inner court, which was guarded at night, but it so happened that the man on duty was a former companion of Pilong, and good-natured enough to listen to his pleading. Before attempting Bilahil's escape, he had told him of the miserable fate awaiting her, and he, remembering her many deeds of kindness, promised not to stand in her way. Pilong still feared treachery, but the man was true to his word, and the fugitives got safely away. They went straight to the river. Bilahilt on no account would allow the men of God to be privy to her flight, thereby endangering their own safety, but having joined her women, she at once took boat, Pilong being of the party. Not a word was spoken. The little craft was borne away by the current, and presently, when the women plied the oars while Pilong steered, the boat shot swiftly along and passed Hushheim, the inhabitants of which slept their unsuspecting sleep. Not till the forenoon was Bilahilt missed from her chamber. Gyla first of all had the Cenobi searched, although she could hardly expect Bilahilt to be hiding so dangerously near. Not finding her there, the heathen servants were dispatched to scour the neighborhood, but chiefly the roads leading to Bavaria. They returned without her, and Gyla was delighted. It was just what she wanted. For this very reason had she, in Pilung's hearing, given vent to those threats which he repeated to Bilahilt, and which she meant to be acted upon by their flight. And now the young Herzogin had actually fled by stealth for what reason was known to Gyla only. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Billihilt by Julie Sutter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Peace at Last I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. Psalm 2.8 on the evening preceding the night on which Bilahild received the news of her husband's death, two men of God were wending their way through a forest in Hessian land. The long robe of undyed sheep's wool was held up by the girdle, their heads were covered with the broad-brimmed hat, the pilgrim's staff was in their hand, and they strode away actively, bent on reaching their journey's end before the night. One of them, tall and thoughtful, had reached the riper years of manhood, his younger, fair-haired companion being scarcely more than five and twenty. "'Look yonder, Adelham said the former. We now see the wooded heights of Thuringia rising in the purple sunset. The Vesra cannot be far. I think we are near the frontier. Alas, I tremble for Brother Lando. If it be true that the Saxons have crossed the Vesra, pillaging the land as far as the Hessian frontier, he may have fared grievously in his lonely cell. I too am full of fears, replied the younger, for though his cell lies apart in a forest glen, it is not far distant from the Vesra. I trust, rejoined the elder, he may have evaded the danger and found shelter with one of those Hessian nobles who have accepted his preaching. I doubt not, father, but that his spiritual children would protect him from trouble. To which the former assented, but continued after a while. Yet I hope thou art not without the box of healing ointment, lest we should find him in trouble and wounded perchance. I have it with me, father, and whatever may be needed besides. But see, we are at the mouth of the glen, and yonder is Londo's cabin. It seems safe, and the little garden undisturbed. Yet there is no sign of our brother— interposed the elder traveller anxiously. God grant that we may find him safe. The two men quickened their steps. Two lambs were grazing happily on a meadow, and a fallow deer, which Londo had tamed, looked at them with quiet eyes. They opened the door of the cabin, and found Brother Londo on a low stool before his bed, bending towards the couch, and so engrossed that he heard them not. There was not sufficient light in the cabin for them to distinguish the object of his care. But when Adelhelm closed the door with a creak, Londo started anxiously. "'Peace be with thee,' said the elder. "'We have come, brother, trusting to find thee safe.' "'God be thanked!' cried Londo. "'It is Villebrod's voice, and who is thy companion?' "'Brother Adelhelm is with me, who joined me at Erfurt.' "'Blessed be your coming in,' said Londo. "'But let me strike a light that I may see your face.' The pale glimmer of the lamp soon lit up the humble space. The travellers saw that the venerable Londo stood before them safe and sound but they also saw the figure of a dead man on the couch. The lower part of the corpse was covered with the bearskin, but the upper part lay bare. On the chest a shining carbuncle hung suspended on a golden chain. The head was bound up with a cloth. "'How comest thou by this dead man in thy cabin?' asked Villebrot. "'He seems dead, yet there are no signs of death,' said Lando. "'He has lain here three days already. There is neither breath nor pulse, yet it is not the pallor of death, and he is scarcely cold.' "'Didst thou bring him from the battlefield?' asked Adelhelm. "'I did, brother. When the uproar had ceased, I ventured forth in the shelter of the night. I found that there had been a deadly encounter, that the wild Saxons had been on our side of the river, but that they had left again, 
and that the Thuringians also had disappeared from their place of encampment. Then I bethought me whether some poor wounded warrior might not require help, and looking about I came upon the ashes of what evidently had been a great funeral pyre, leaving no doubt that the conquerors had butchered their prisoners and burnt them as a sacrifice to Eeyore. The corpses of those which had fallen in the encounter were lying about, already a prey to the crows and ravens which haunt the battlefield. I turned to quit the ghastly scene, when I perceived a crow settling on a body and leave it again almost immediately. I went nearer, and saw it was a fine manly figure, in buffalo armor, but without sword or helmet, lying pale and still. I touched his hand, and it was warm. I lifted him on my shoulders and brought him to my cabin, and here he has been lying these three days, pale, motionless, without breath or sign of life, but warm. I have found no wound on him but the marks of a blow on his head, which I keep therefore bandaged with cold water. I was trying to listen to the beat of his heart when you entered. I had vainly done so before, but this time it seemed as though there were a slight pulsation. "'Let us try,' said Adelhelm, plucking a small feather from a tame pigeon which shared Londo's cabin, and placing the fluffy down upon the lips of the lifeless warrior, when the feather trembled almost imperceptibly at measured intervals. "'He lives! He breathes! The Lord be praised!' cried Adelhelm. "'Let us call upon our God,' said Villebrod, kneeling, "'that he may be gracious unto him and restore his life.' Villebrod would not leave Londo's cabin before they knew the Lord's will concerning the unknown warrior, and whether he would die or live. They hoped for the latter. Adelhelm went to prepare a couch for himself and Father Villebrod, while Londo busied himself in getting ready a humble supper for his guests. Villebrod, in the meantime, watched the pale-faced man, again and again listening for the beating of his heart, and it did beat more and more frequently. They took their supper in quiet haste, and returning to the bedside, wetted the sick man's lips which seemed less white than before, and behold, he swallowed the water thirstily. They repeated the attempt. The breathing became more and more regular. Towards midnight he opened his eyes, and seeing men about him with unknown faces, though otherwise of well-known dress and appearance, he closed them again with a sigh, and sighing again he whispered, Villahild. We shall leave him, body and soul, to the care of the men of God, returning ourselves to the Würzburg. It was on a Wednesday morning that Villahild's flight had been discovered. That also was the day sacred to Woden, when the great sacrifice in memory of Hayden's death was to be celebrated, and Regisvinz should be killed by Woden's priest. But Gila was obliged to postpone her intentions. Villahild's escape required half the inhabitants of the Borg to be dispatched on the search, and the proposed sacrifice must be honored by the presence of all. Moreover, Regisvinz had been greatly disfigured by Gila's blows. Her face was covered with unsightly marks of violence which would not heal in the damp hole assigned to her abode, yet she must present a fair countenance to be offered up to the god, for which reason a respite was granted until the Wednesday a fortnight hence. The evil day came round. Not in the forest, as was usual, but in the inner court the pyre was raised. Triumphant Gila had chosen the very place where her husband, Gotzbert, had renounced all heathen worship. The whole household was gathered in a circle, and as the ill-fated horses and boars were being prepared for the night, wild songs to Woden rose on the air. The tumult was heard as far as the Cenobi, filling the congregation with grief and horror. The chief victim was now called for, and Regisvind was dragged to the spot. One of the priests held the knife, while another bared her bosom to receive it. She prayed aloud to God in heaven. Her words were overpowered by the bloodthirsty howling of her murderers, but louder than this even resounded a piercing cry of horror, and Gila fell to the ground. And the silence which followed it was more terrible even than the noise. What was it? The eyes of all were upon Gila, but she, writhing on the ground, pointed in agony to the Borg gate. "'What evil work is being done here?' cried Hayden imperiously, for it was he who had appeared at the entrance, followed by a number of his Christian nobles. None dared answer. Regisvind only, after a while, found strength to give a trembling account of what had happened and what was being done. "'And where is Billahilt? demanded the Herzog. "'Hiding, no doubt, in her chamber,' said Regisvind, who knew nothing of her flight. They drove her from her rightful place in the hall long ago. But now Gila jumped up, rejoicing in the news she thought she could give, and cried with evil laughter, She has fled from the Borg, ashamed to stay. It is a fortnight since she disappeared in the dead of the night. God forbid, exclaimed the Herzog. A great length indeed thou must have driven her before she could take such a step. Give me back my wife. Ask Giselhar to give her back to thee, sneered Gila. I am innocent of her flight. Giselhar has been seen in the Cenobi. I doubt me not, but he knows where she may be hiding. He is here, and ready to answer your charge against the noble Herzogin. And Giselhar himself stepped forward from among the warriors. 
I was in the Cenobi, as you say, and I had ample proof of your cruelty to the God-fearing lady. I did offer to save her from her heathen surroundings, forgetting in my selfish blindness that it was the Lord who had placed her there. But she steadfastly refused to accept my protection to Regensburg, and even refused to see me. Yes, more than this, she commanded me to leave Würzburg unless I would have her acquaint you herself of my presence. Seeing she was in earnest, but knowing her danger, and still desirous of saving her, I rode off at once to call together the Christian nobles who, I knew, would gather round their Herzogin. But it cost me days and nights before I found our brave Thuringians. They had beaten the Saxons, making good the defeat sustained by the Vestra, and were even then pursuing them beyond the frontier of their own country. And when at last I came upon them as they returned victoriously, we fell in with a Hessian freeman who spoke to us, saying, If ye be Thuringians, sirs, and anxious perchance to see your own Herzog again, follow me, for your Herzog is not dead as ye deem, but living with Londo and Villebrod, the men of God. And he showed us the way to the Crossburg beyond the Vesra, where we found the noble Hayden healed in body and soul, and we witnessed his baptism by Father Villebrod. I can add to this testimony, now said Regisvind, addressing herself to Gyla. And indeed, I have assured you already that our Herzogin would have nothing to say to the noble Giselhar. You expected me to bear false testimony against her, and when I refused, you ill-treated me with your own hands and condemned me to a cruel death. All this will not explain her flight, said Hayden, turning again to his mother. Once more I ask thee, to what length thou hast driven her, before she could leave the Borg? I can tell, so it please you, now spoke the doorkeeper who was on guard that night. She threatened Pilung to sacrifice him together with Regisvind and she threatened the Herzogin to hold her a prisoner and bring her to the fire ordeal, but me she commanded not to hinder the lady's flight if she chose to go. "'Whither is she gone? Give me back my wife!' cried Hayden, beside himself with pity and grief, taking hold of his mother by the arm, yet dropping it again immediately. "'She is my mother,' added he. "'I will not be her judge nor her keeper. I give her to your care, my nobles. Hold her safe, lest she work further sorrow.' One of the nobles, Rodbert by name, accepted the charge, and led her away with him to his borg. The heathen priests were tied and imprisoned by Hayden's command. "'Woe is me to be bereaved of so faithful a wife,' said he. "'Yet it is God's just retribution for my sinful distrust of her. I am not worthy of such a wife. I pray God to make me better than I was. I would fain ride in search of her, not stopping day or night that I might find her again. Yet the ruler is tied to his Würzburg by all important duties. But thou, brother Giselhar, Thou mayest go in search of her, and perchance bring her back to me." And Giselhar, accepting the trust, rode off at once, directing his horse's head to Hushheim, hoping to learn of Totman whether Billihelt had any relatives to whom she might have gone in her distress. But the venerable Totman had departed this life. Gertrude had some recollection of having heard Michel mention an uncle of Billihilt's, but where he lived she knew not, nor could she remember his name. Autumn and winter passed, and Hayden had no news of Billihilt. All his attempts to hear of her proved fruitless. Giselhar, too, had returned from an unsuccessful search, and was again at Herzog Tordo's court. Spring had come to the country, when one day a messenger arrived at Regensburg, sent by the Frankish king, Kildebert. Speaking to Tordo and his nobles, he related much of new Cenobis he had seen on his journey, and how the gospel was finding entrance everywhere. Amongst other places, this messenger had visited a school at Moguncia, founded by a niece of Abbot Bishop Siegfried for the Christian training of young maidens. Siegfried's niece herself was but young, he said, and had fled with her women and a maimed manservant from a heathen mother-in-law. Giselhar started. "'When was this?' he exclaimed. "'Some months ago,' replied the messenger. The young abbess had bought the land for her foundation, paying for it with twelve silver shields and twelve black steeds, which her uncle gave her as her share of the property come to her by her Irish parentage. "'Yes, yes!' cried Giselhar, "'and her name is Bilihild. It may be, said the Frank. I do not remember her name. Within two days of this conversation, Herzog Hayden received a letter by Giselhar's fleetest runner. Hayden tore it open and turned pale, then read. He gave immediate orders for a vessel to be got ready, and having put the Borg in charge of a trusted freeman, he took boat, accompanied by a suitable retinue, and sailed down the main. Regiswind was of the party. It was a pleasant journey between the wooded heights, but Hayden's heart grew heavier day by day. It was early in April, just about a year since he first met Billihild among the beech trees. Sadness filled his soul as he thought of that meeting. "'Will she come to me now, if I find her again?' said he within himself. "'She cannot but have heard by this time that I am alive. Why has she not returned to me? Or is it all a mistake, and the young abbess is not my Billihild?" On the sixth day at noon the vessel was carried by the main into the stately Rhine, and anchored before Moguncia. 
Pilung was tending the cattle on a meadow, when lifting his eyes he beheld a young woman, walking swiftly along. But seeing him she turned and came up to him. He seemed to know her, yet waited doubtfully another moment, and— "'Regisvind, is it thyself or a spirit?' he said. "'It is myself, Pilung,' she said, smiling. "'Why shouldst thou take me for a ghost?' "'But thou wast going to be—' and he was unable to continue. "'Going to be sacrificed to Vodun,' said she, taking up his sentence. "'Yes, but by the grace of God I have escaped. I found shelter with an honest man, and am now in the service of one who has shipping on the main.' "'The Lord be praised who saved thee,' rejoined Pilla. "'But tell me, is it true that our Herzog lives? We heard some time ago that peace was restored in the Würzburg, and that a ruler had returned. We thought that perchance one of Herzog Hayden's relatives might have been chosen by the people, but quite lately we learned that our own Herzog Hayden had come back from the war. We could not believe it. Our much-honoured abbess cried sore at the news. Is he indeed alive, and has he not made search for me? He could but have inquired of Totman, who would surely have told him that my uncle is abbot bishop of Monguntia. But I fear me my husband is offended that I left the Borg. His mother Gaila has turned his heart from me, and I dare not venture back to the Würzburg. So she says, and tears are her portion every day. But now thou art come with certain news of the Herzog. Tell me, how is he minded? "'How should I know?' replied Regisvin, keeping up her role. "'Did I not tell thee I escaped to an honest man? In those days none knew what had become of the Herzog.' "'True,' assented Pilla. "'But now hasten to the abbess. She will receive thee gladly. Would I could leave the herd to go with thee.' "'I am on my way to her, but not alone,' said Regisvin. "'My master, who brought me hither on his ship, desires to consult her concerning a maiden to be educated. Dost thou think she will receive him? He is waiting my answer, and wishes me to take him to Billihild for I told him I was in her service formerly. "'The abbess receives any one that requires to see her,' said Pilla. "'Go fetch thy master and go with him.' "'He follows me yonder. Farewell till we meet again.' And Pilla watched her speed away towards a man who, from his dress and bearing, seemed a shipmaster, as she had described him. But Pilla could not see his face light up with joy at the account Regisvind gave him. He watched them walk away toward Billihilt's present home. The shipmaster was sufficiently disguised by a wig and a false beard appearing an elderly man in his adopted garb. They entered the courtyard leading to the school, and having inquired for the lady abbess, were directed to an antechamber leading to the hall in which Billihilt taught her youthful charges. Regisvind remained outside, while her master entered the anteroom. With beating heart he saw the door open which led from the hall, and Billihilt, in a simple woolen robe, stepped forth. A sleeping babe lay on her arm. "'What is your desire?' she asked kindly. "'I would speak to you, noble Herzogin.' replied he, with an unusually deep voice. "'Not Herzogin, but Abbess,' she corrected him quickly, almost sharply. "'Excuse me,' continued the visitor, "'but I was wont to call you thus in former days, when you used to join in worship at the Versburg Cenobi. "'Alas!' she cried, "'what times are these you bring to my mind?' "'Yes,' said he, "'in those days your husband lived and had you by his side, but you were not happy.' "'Who are you?' interrupted Billahilt sternly. To speak to me thus, those who do their duty are ever happy." "'Yes, yes,' assented he. "'You did your duty, but he treated you unworthily.' "'How dare you accuse my husband to my face! If this is all your business with me, I have no more to say to you.' And she turned to go. "'Stay, noble lady, and let me deliver my commission.' He touched her arm. The little boy awoke, crowing lustily. But he, taking from his bosom a carbuncle suspended by a golden chain, hung it round the child's neck. "'What is this?' cried Billihild. "'How do you come by this jewel, the Herzog's heirloom, which his own father put on him when he was yet a babe in arms, and which he never parted with, to my knowledge?' "'True,' said he. "'The Herzog's heirloom has always passed to the son and heir with the father's first blessing.' "'But how do you come by it? Have they robbed my husband in death and sold you the jewel? Oh, say what you would have, and let me redeem it!' "'I cannot sell it. It belongs to the child now to whom it passed from my hands.' But no enemy stole this jewel, and the Herzog never parted with it. Have you never heard the report, lady, that Hayden is not dead, but lives?" "'I have heard it,' she said with uncertain, almost frightened voice. "'But it seemed more than I could believe.' "'Why so? There are others who live, though you believe them dead. Regisvind, for instance.' And Regisvind entered. Billihild, seeing her, gave a cry, and putting down the child, she clasped the waiting woman in her arms. She could not speak. "'Yes, dear Herzogin,' said Regisvind, taking up the child and fondling it. "'I am indeed returned from the very gates of death. 
the knife was lifted to slay me when the Herzog appeared, whom we had mourned as dead. And the Lord has brought him to life in a double sense. He is a Christian now, and a true believer. And what would you say, dear lady, if he himself were present to confirm this happy news? Billyhilt turned uneasily. The shipmaster had thrown off his disguise. She was clasped to her husband's heart. Three days later they set out to return to the Würzburg, where they arrived towards the end of April, the school of Maguncia having passed to the care of another abbess. Joyously rose the hymns of praise and thanksgiving from both Cenobis, when the ship, drawn up the river by six stout horses, returned with the happy pair. No sooner had they entered their own Würzburg than a servant announced a man of God coming from Hessian land with a special message to the Herzog. He had arrived the day before, and was waiting in the Cenobi. "'That is Villebrug, exclaimed Hayden. "'Bring him hither, speedily. He is a welcome guest, and shall bless our happy union.' It was Villebrug, indeed, bringing news which moved both Hayden and Billahilt greatly. "'I have visited Rodbert on my journey hither,' said he, "'and have seen your mother, Anna.' "'Her name is Gyla, interrupted Hayden. "'It was Gyla," said the man of God. "'She is Anna now.' I learned from Rodbert that she has been ailing through the winter. She had times of great despondency, but repulsed every attempt to approach her with spiritual help. I went into her. "'What is thy desire, thou man of God?' cried she. "'Hast thou come to call me to judgment? Thy God is terrible, powerful, victorious, and no lie can live when he speaketh.' "'Yes, Gyla, I said. He is the holy and just who hath sent me. He has seen thy heart, that it is black, and thy sins, that they are as scarlet.' He passed by thee, and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, and said unto thee, Live. Yea, thou shalt live through the blood of his only Son, shed for thee on the cross. He, the merciful Redeemer, will heal thee, Gyla. He will snatch thee from death and darkness. He will take thee by the hand, and bring thee to his father, saying, Father, forgive her, I have borne her iniquities. And behold, she seized my hand with a torrent of tears, continuing in anguish for hours. But on the seventh day she received baptism. Her health is broken. She has not many days to live, and is anxious to see you and the Herzogin, that she may not die without your forgiveness. Hayden and Billahilt set off at once for Ruadbertsburg, to behold there the greatest triumph of gospel grace, and to assure the dying mother of their forgiving love. Having returned to the Würzburg after her death, Hayden felt desirous of proving his gratitude to Villebrot, his spiritual father, and did so by a grant of land, enabling him thereby to found new Cenobis in the northern part of Thuringia, which was still a stronghold of heathenism. The deed of gift, dated April 30th, 704, is still extant, by which the Herzog made over to Villebrot, his father in Christ, his possessions at Arnstadt, also the land and castle of Mullenburg, near Gotha, and the village Monhove, between Arnstadt and Weimar. Villebrot charged his disciple Adelhelm with the founding of these new Cenobis. In the summer, Hayden gave Regisvent to his servant Pilung to wife, thereby meeting the desire of both their hearts. The wedding was on a Friday, according to ancient usage, which appropriated this day for serving folk. Freemen and lords always married on the Tuesday. The Christian congregation spread and grew, and the old Cenobi no longer could hold the numbers, but Hayden built a large, beautiful church at the foot of his Würzburg. And God blessed Billahilt and her husband with another child, besides their little son Turing, giving them a daughter, whom they called Emina. The boy Turing was a delicate child, and died before his father. Thus the rulership passed to another house. Amina lived to see the Irish Cenobis brought to the Pope's subjection, having first been forced to yield to the Frankish supremacy by Pepin de Aristal. Centuries of darkness came upon the Church, but though hiding the pure light of the Gospel, they could not quench it. The Lord had prepared another time when, in Thuringia and elsewhere, men of God arose, strong to wield the sword of the Spirit and tear asunder the lying tissue of human invention preaching the old, unchangeable gospel truth of Christ, the only Savior of men. Error is old, but older still is the truth which overcometh it. End of chapter 9 End of Billihilt, A Tale of the Irish Missionaries in Germany, A.D. 703 Given in English by Julie Sutter